You're gonna get one. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. When Scott Hall and Kevin Nash made the jump from the WWF to WCW in 1996, the wrestling world got turned upside down. Razor Ramon and Big Daddy Cool Diesel had been key players in Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation, garnering a huge amount of fan support during the WWF's New Generation movement, and losing two of these big names to the opposition, World Championship Wrestling, was a huge blow to the company. No one could have predicted the impact that Nash and Hall would make in WCW. The two men had worked for World Championship Wrestling previously with limited success, but this time it was very, very different. Billed as the Outsiders, the former Razor Ramon and Diesel would usher in a new era in WCW, kickstarting the company's most groundbreaking and lucrative storyline in history. Today's video looks at the WCW debut of the Outsiders. Razor Ramon was the first guy to reach out and try to get a deal with WCW. Razor had been an excellent Intercontinental Champion in the World Wrestling Federation and a big fan favourite too, but he wanted to earn more money within wrestling. Scott had asked Vince McMahon if he could get a pay raise or even if he could work some dates in Japan to try and earn a little more on the side. Both ideas were shot down by Vince. Scott Hall was good friends with Diamond Dallas Page, and when DDP learned that Scott's contract was coming up with the World Wrestling Federation and Scott wanted to potentially earn more money, Dallas spoke to Eric Bischoff and a lucrative offer was made to bring Razor Ramon to WCW. Scott Hall said, I went to Vince McMahon and asked if I could improve my situation with the company. I didn't want to leave, but at that time, Vince felt no. Vince couldn't accommodate me the way I wanted to be accommodated, so I had to do what I felt was best for my family, and that was to accept an offer from WCW. It goes back to what Chief J Strongbow said to me, in this business you can make friends or you can make money. I looked at Kevin, and I looked at Kid, I've already made friends, I'd like the money. So Scott Hall worked his final WWF date on the 19th of May 1996, putting Triple H over before the infamous curtain call incident in Madison Square Garden, and someone else who also worked his final match on this very date was Big Daddy Cool Diesel. Diesel had been the WWF champion during most of 1995. The WWF had ran on diesel power for a little while, Big Daddy Cool had been billed as the leader of the WWF's new generation, and he was a cornerstone of the WWF's movement to get away from superstars of the past during the mid-90s. Kevin was good friends with Scott, he was also good friends with the 123 Kid, Triple H and Shawn Michaels, and when Scott told Kevin how much WCW had offered him, Big Daddy Cool instantly wanted a piece of the pie. Kevin said, Scott pulled me aside and he said he got an offer to work for Turner. I asked him how much and he told me. I asked him for how many days and he said 150. I said what? It was huge money, and it was guaranteed money, so I got on the phone. Dallas Page was kind of brokering the deal. Eric didn't want to be seen as interfering or talking to us. I went through Dallas, and they made an offer to me. So I talked to Vince, I said, this is the offer they gave me, I want to stay. If you can match the offer, I'll stay. Vince McMahon said that both Kevin and Scott were willing to take a little less on their WCW offer but the WWF would have to guarantee their income, and Vince McMahon didn't offer guaranteed money during this time frame. Vince would say he doesn't offer guarantees but he does offer opportunities. This wasn't enough to keep Razor Ramon and Diesel on the WWF books though. The two men decided to leave, and Diesel had his last match in Madison Square Garden also on May 19th, 1996. The 
losing to WWF Champion Shawn Michaels in a steel cage match. After the bout, the curtain call incident took place. The click broke kayfabe in the middle of the ring to give Scott and Kevin an emotional send-off to WCW. Vince McMahon later admitted that if he knew the impact Kevin Nash and Scott Hall would have on the WCW vs WWF Monday Night War, then he would have offered them enough money to stay put. WCW executive producer Eric Bischoff had been studying Japanese wrestling during the early to mid 90s and he had become enamoured with the UWF vs New Japan invasion angle throughout 1995 and early 1996. When WCW had secured Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, two of the WWF's biggest stars, Eric felt he could reenact some key aspects of the UWF vs New Japan storyline when it was time for both men to make their television debuts. Eric said, In the United States, the WWF and WCW were really having a hard time in the live event side of things while in Japan they were putting 60, 80, 100,000 people in the Tokyo Dome for big shows. To sum it up, I was over there kind of studying what worked and the differences between the way the product was presented in Japan in comparison to the States. One of the things I noticed, it was much more real there. The storylines, the characters, the action in the ring was more reality based. Here in the United States it was more about characters and comedy. In Japan I was watching the intercompany wars, that kind of thing, and that's where the NWO idea started. Scott became available, Kevin became available, and that loose idea I had from studying Japan became kind of a reality. The May 27th 1996 episode of Nitro was remarkable for two things. Firstly, this episode of Nitro was the first two hour broadcast of WCW's flagship show, a move here that would eventually force the WWF to also move to a two hour format down the road. Secondly, Scott Hall made his debut on this very same episode of Monday Nitro. During a match pitting The Mauler against Steve Dahl, Scott Hall appeared from the audience, making his way down to the ring to interrupt the this match. The way this was booked was perfect. Scott Hall got in the ring and said one of the most infamous quotes in wrestling history when he said, You people, you know who I am. But you don't know why I'm here. Scott went on to ask where Billionaire Ted and the Nacho Man were. These were names the WWF used to mock Ted Turner and Randy Savage, and this is important when looking back at this promo. Scott was using terms that the World Wrestling Federation had been using to poke fun at WCW, so by using these names, Scott himself was also making fun of World Championship Wrestling. Scott said that he can go wherever he wants, whenever he wants, before ending his promo by saying, you want to go to war? You want a war? You're going to get one. What's never really talked about here is how Tony Schiavone reacted on commentary after Scott Hall's promo. Randy Anderson, the referee from the match that Scott Hall had interrupted, got on the apron and asked Scott to leave. Tony Schiavone could be heard asking Randy what was going on, adding a sense of realism to the segment and that feeling of this wasn't supposed to happen. Tony then said that it looks like the match had been cancelled before apologising to fans before going off to commercial break. Shivani doesn't really get credit for this and I think he definitely helped add a sort of surreal feeling to the whole thing. He helped portray what WCW and Eric Bischoff were trying to present here for sure. Scott Hall wasn't done though. The former Razor Ramon promised us all that he would speak with Eric Bischoff before the end of the night. Bischoff took over on commentary for the second hour of Nitro and to end the broadcast, Scott Hall approached Eric at the commentary table. Scott told Eric Bischoff that billionaire Ted should find three of his top guys to take on Scott Hall and some of his friends, but there was no mentioning of who Scott's friends could be. Scott kept saying things like, we are going to take over, and while Eric Bischoff would ask Scott who he was referring to, Scott wouldn't give Eric any answers. 
Paul said the war should take place in the ring, not in the dirt sheets. It should be a match inside the squared circle where it matters. The Nitro broadcast ended with Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan looking at each other totally lost for words. Again, it was played off really well by the broadcast team and like Tony Schiavone earlier on, I don't think these guys get enough credit for their reactions to Scott Hall's WCW debut and these threats of a takeover. The very next week, Nitro ended the same way when Scott Hall interrupted Eric Bischoff at the commentary desk. Scott said it was Eric Bischoff who started this war, but Hall and his friends are going to finish it. This was in regards to the creation of Nitro by the way. Scott was trying to say that Eric Bischoff fired the first shots by going head to head with Raw. And so Scott and what we could only assume were some of his WWF buddies were going to shut WCW up for good. Hall was implying he was still with the WWF here by the way. The key word though is implying. Never once did Scott say he and the WWF were going to take over WCW, but his use of names like Skeen, Gene and the Nacho Man, along with his threats to bring a war to WCW and Scott himself sounding exactly like Razor Ramon, all of this was scripted to make it seem like Scott was bringing a fight to WCW from the WWF. Anyway, Sting interrupted Scott Hall here on Nitro while defending the honour of WCW. Scott Hall threw a toothpick at Sting, a classic Razor Ramon move, and Sting replied with a slap to the face. Enraged, Scott said he has a big surprise next week on Nitro for both Eric Bischoff and The Stinger. So let's move on to the June 10th WCW Nitro, the episode before the Great American Bash and an interesting week indeed when talking about the Outsiders. When he was once again interrupted by Scott Hall, Eric Bischoff asked where the big surprise was. Kevin Nash then walked into frame, Big Daddy Cool Diesel had arrived in WCW. Kevin Nash's promo here was great by the way, but it's remembered for a botch. Kevin Nash said to Eric Bischoff, this is where the big boys play, huh? Look at the adjective, play. We ain't here to play. Yeah, a small hiccup there that didn't go unnoticed. But anyway, Kevin said that WCW should get to work dusting off some fossils to get ready for the war. Eric Bischoff then delivered a classic bait and switch. Eric said he has a meeting with WCW executives in Atlanta the following day and he will see if the higher ups will allow three guys to bring the fight at the Great American Bash pay per view. Of course the hostile takeover wouldn't happen at the Great American Bash, WCW were going to milk this one a little while longer, but something else happened at the Great American Bash that is very important. The WWF had forced Kevin Nash and Scott Hall legitimately to declare they were not representatives of the World Wrestling Federation. How did the WWF manage to do this? Well, WCW had gotten word that Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation were going to try and sue WCW. When Scott Hall came over to WCW, his mannerisms, his voice, even the way he walked, it was a carbon copy of his Razor Ramon character from the WWF. Vince McMahon owned both the Razor Ramon and Diesel characters, from the names to the entrance music, the likeness, the rights, the WWF owned everything that was Razor Ramon and Diesel, except Scott Hall and Kevin Nash themselves. So over on WCW here, we have Scott Hall walking out talking with his Cuban Razor Ramon accent, talking about the Nacho Man and Skeen Gene in a WWF-esque manner, saying he was going to bring a war to WCW that Eric Bischoff instigated with the debut of Monday Nitro and WCW's rivalry with the WWF. Vince McMahon didn't take too kindly to this. Vince felt that Eric was using the Razor Ramon and Diesel gimmicks that he owned in order to gain an advantage over the WWF by presenting this invasion angle. Of course, Razor Ramon and Diesel were not sent by the WWF at all, but WCW had been implying this whole time that the duo were representing the World Wrestling Federation. To get this settled and to try and stop the whole angle completely, the WWF took WCW to court, accusing Turner's wrestling organisation of defamation, slander, trademark infringement and unfair competition. 
As part of the complaint, the WWF sought an immediate temporary restraining order against further use of Scott Hall and Kevin Nash in ways that could deceive or confuse wrestling fans into thinking the World Wrestling Federation was affiliated with this ongoing WCW storyline. So basically, Vince McMahon was trying to stop the NWO storyline from happening. The case dragged on, but the knee-jerk reaction from Eric Bischoff and WCW was to have Kevin Nash and Scott Hall come out of the Great American Bash pay-per-view and admit to the world that they were actually not representing the World Wrestling Federation. Point blank, Eric asked both men, do you work for the WWF, and both men said no. Here's another interesting fact. Part of the eventual settlement terms of this very lawsuit would give the WWF the right to bid on WCW properties should they ever be up for liquidation. This means, in a roundabout way, the NWO was the reason why Vince McMahon was able to purchase WCW. Anyway, both companies were able to settle out of court. There's much more to this lawsuit and we could literally talk for hours about it, so let's move on. WCW were not allowed to mention that any future NWO members were previously hired by the World Wrestling Federation, leading to the WWF trying and failing to get the last laugh with the fake Razor Ramon and fake Diesel characters on WWF television, a shining example of Vince McMahon's pettiness here. Ironically, when it was announced that Razor and Diesel would return to the WWF just before we were introduced to these fake versions, Scott and Kevin got a pay rise in WCW. Hall and Nash were signed to what was known in WCW as Deal Memos, pretty much a preliminary contract that outlines the legalities of the working agreement between the company and the worker, but signing a Deal Memo isn't the same as signing your final contract. Hall and Nash could, in theory, return to the WWF at any time before their legitimate final contracts had been signed. So when the WWF said that Razor and Diesel would return on television, WCW panicked, pushing more money in the faces of Nash and Hall in order to expedite the signing of their final WCW contracts. So Vince McMahon's pettiness over the Razor and Diesel characters actually led to the real Kevin Nash and Scott Hall getting paid more money in WCW. It's truly an unbelievable and remarkable tale of Vince McMahon man constantly shooting himself in the foot. The real Razor Ramon and Diesel would use their real names in WCW, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash respectively, and the WWF couldn't really stop WCW from going ahead with the storyline as long as WCW didn't exploit the fact that Hall and Nash, along with the whole NWO, were former WWF guys. At the Great American Bash then, the Outsiders would not have a match. As previously mentioned, Eric asked both Hall and Nash if they worked for the WWF. Both men said no. Eric then said that three WCW guys would face Hall, Nash and their third mystery partner at Bash at the Beach 1996. But Hall and Nash got pissed off when Eric wouldn't reveal who would represent WCW in the six-man tag. Eric ended up taking a jackknife powerbomb to end the segment. Mean Gene Okerlund announced the next night on Monday Nitro that Sting, Lex Luger and Randy Savage would be the three men representing WCW at Bash at the Beach. Nash and Hall, now known as the Outsiders, were still a man down though, and I'm not going to go into great detail here regarding Hulk Hogan by the way, it's already been covered and you guys I'm sure all know the story. But the big question leading up to Bash at the Beach now was who is this mystery third partner who would be siding with Hall and Nash? Again, you guys know the story, but let's wrap things up here and focus on what the Outsiders got up to right before the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view. On the June 24th edition of Nitro, we had a good triple team tag match, the Steiners vs Harlem Heat vs Lex Luger and Sting. Towards the end of the match, the Outsiders made their way to the ring through the audience. A bunch of security guys stormed the ring to make sure Hall and Nash couldn't interfere in the main event, but the damage was already done. The Outsiders had pretty much put an end to the Nitro main event, bringing WCW's flagship show to a complete standstill. Hall and Nash bought tickets to the July 1st 1996 episode of Nitro, meaning WCW security were unable to throw the Outsiders out of the building. 
The guys couldn't help themselves though. Hall and Nash grabbed a microphone and started patronising Eric Bischoff. As the outsiders were approaching the commentary table, the WCW locker room emptied. Baby faces and heels who would normally be squaring off against each other all came out to ensure Hall and Nash couldn't get any closer. Eventually, security got rid of the outsiders and the show ended with the security guys forcing Hall and Nash to get in their car and leave the arena. That Sunday, the hostile takeover was booked for Bash at the Beach. Hall and Nash had their very first match since returning to WCW and history was made when Hulk Hogan joined the Outsiders and the New World Order was born. And so, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall had ushered in a new era for WCW, an era based on Eric Bischoff's vision and an era that changed the course of professional wrestling itself. I don't think I need to explain how important the New World Order was to wrestling in the 90s. The Outsiders would become one of WCW's most successful tag teams, capturing the tag titles six times while gaining a huge fan following thanks to how WCW presented the New World Order as cool villains. After some time, Shawn Michaels and Triple H formed their own tag team that, when you think about it, really did have a lot of similarities when comparing to the Outsiders. Both teams included members of the Click, both teams were heels but they got cheered for being rebellious, and both teams used their backstage stroke to further their own standing within the company. People today call this a bad thing, and maybe it is, but when you talk about producing results, setting legitimate trends and breaking new ground, well, both The Outsiders and the original D-Generation X done all of these things. The Outsiders, however, maybe struggled with longevity, but that's something we can look at in another video. Something I did take away here though when watching this all back was how WCW completely altered their presentation when Hall and Nash would make appearances just to make it feel real. I watch a lot of old WCW Nitro episodes and these things may appear subtle to your average viewer, but commentators would immediately change their tone when talking about Hall and Nash. Pre-recorded videos about completely unassociated wrestlers would end abruptly if the outsiders made an appearance. WCW even used camera angles that were never used before when Hall and Nash showed up. We saw more of the arena, we saw things that weren't part of the regular broadcast and these subtle changes made a huge difference. Look out for this if you decide to go back and relive this time period in WCW. In today's video, we're going to take a look at Hulk Hogan's first year in the New World Order. Hulk Hogan by far is the most requested superstar on this channel, and I feel that making a one and done video for Hulk Hogan would be both impossible and unfair. The man means so much to wrestling and has done so much during his active years that I feel the best thing to do would be to look at certain time periods of his career. Hogan will appear on this channel at different times, we won't spend weeks on Hogan because, well, although he is the most requested superstar, not everyone wants to see consecutive videos for weeks based on one guy. So let's start at one of the more interesting time periods for Hulk Hogan, the first year of the extremely successful and lucrative New World Order in WCW. In the summer of 1996, Hulk Hogan was able to reignite his career when he became a bad guy in wrestling. For over a decade, the Hulkster had been telling us to eat our vitamins and say our prayers as he portrayed the all-American hero on television screens to great success. Hulk was smart enough to notice that times had changed even by mid-1996. People were getting tired of the same old Hulk Hogan and people were now starting to get behind the concept of cool villains in wrestling. Hogan's audience receptions, before becoming a bad guy, had been good but nowhere near as great as what they once were. 
I don't think Hogan would have ever faded in the obscurity had he not joined the New World Order, but I do agree that Hulk Hogan and the red and yellow stuff was getting quite tiresome. You have to understand that Hogan did not have to join the NWO in order to remain financially stable within WCW. Looking over Hogan's contract at the time, we can see that the guy was making serious money from the day he joined the company. What is interesting though is Hulk Hogan's WCW incentives, his bonuses within the company. In the most basic terms, Hogan got 15% of pay-per-view buys as a financial bonus, and if buy rates were particularly high for WCW domestic pay-per-views, Hogan got paid even bigger amounts of money based on the success of each individual show. Hogan also got 25% of ticket sales for every Nitro and Thunder show that he appeared in with a guarantee of no less than 25 grand per show. So it's clear that it was in Hogan's best interests for people to attend shows and buy pay-per-views at home. And while gambling on the NWO wasn't a necessity, you can see that Hulk stood to make much more money if he and WCW was a success. When fans were getting tired of Hulkamania, you best believe he would hitch a ride with the NWO in hopes that shocking the world and becoming a heel would make people tune into WCW shows and buy pay-per-view shows. But still, the decision to turn heel didn't come easy to Hulk Hogan. Hulk was, and still is, very aware of how lucrative the Hulk Hogan brand is. During his time in the WWF, the man became a household name, and even still in the mid-90s, his name carried weight. Hogan had been smart and savvy enough to protect the Hulkamania image both on a commercial level and by making sure he'd done what was right for Hulk Hogan in the ring, and if he were to turn into a bad guy, there was a serious threat there that this very image would be somewhat cheapened. The decision that Hulk Hogan had to make was, in very simplified terms, based on risk versus reward. Does he risk the Hulkamania empire for the possibility of higher pay bonuses with WCW while adding a new layer to his character? Or does he keep the red and yellow image and mildly successful endorsements simply coasting along and collecting guaranteed money? To put it in perspective, Kevin Sullivan revealed that Hulk Hogan's agent, Peter Young, cried, actually cried, on the phone to him until 2.30 in the morning that WCW should not and could not turn Hulk Hogan heel. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash arrived in WCW in the summer of 1996, claiming they were in World Championship Wrestling with the intention of taking over the company. Hall and Nash had been successful in the WWF as Razor Ramon and Diesel, and they said they had another partner who would be revealed at WCW Bash at the Beach 96. Rumours were rampant of who the third man could be, with Sting, Bret Hart, and even Davy Boy Smith being names that seemed to constantly creep up. Scott Hall said, we had no idea who it was going to be. The whole third guy thing came up by accident. I remember Kev and I called Brett and I spoke to him. Kev spoke to him and we told him it was really fun working at WCW. It was really laid back, guaranteed money, it was easy. We were so used to being in a shark tank in New York. Coming to Atlanta was like being in a country club. It was really tame in the locker room in WCW compared to New York. We told Brett he should come down. Bischoff was interested, he was offering him a pretty sweet deal, but Brett wasn't interested. We wanted it to be Hulk, but Hulk had creative control in his contract, so he didn't have to do anything he didn't want to do. We went to the ring, we hadn't even met Hulk yet. I met him briefly at WrestleMania 9, but I didn't know Hulk. We actually went to the ring in Daytona and Hogan wasn't even there yet. He was on a jet, flying cross country from shooting a movie. Bischoff wanted it to be Hulk before we went out. Bischoff told us, if Hulk doesn't show, I'm gonna send out Sting. Going back a little, Eric Bischoff revealed in his book that he had meetings with Hulk in Hulk's home regarding the Hulkster becoming the third man in the New World Order. Hogan apparently wasn't sold on the idea initially, mainly due to being the good guy in wrestling was what gave him his fame and fortune. Bischoff left Hogan's house without a straight answer, and it was days later when Hogan picked up the phone and confirmed to Eric that he was in, he was going to turn heel. As Scott Hall mentioned, 
Eric was still wary of Hogan changing his mind or not even showing up at Bash at the Beach, so if Hogan didn't show or if Hogan changed his mind, Sting would have been the third man. Crazy to think that even if a plane was delayed or if Hogan slept in that day, then the future of WCW would have looked way, way different. Eric Bischoff said on his 83 Weeks podcast, I think at the time, probably a week before Bash at the Beach, is when I started letting people know about Hulk. I think I let Kevin Nash know. I know I was out in Los Angeles doing something because we met for a beer at Sunset Boulevard at some biker bar. I wasn't sure if it was going to be Hulk Hogan or Sting. One was plan A and the other was plan B. I tried to let Kevin know how much he should know, and the other part was because I was worried he would leak it out, so it was probably a week before I let those that needed to know, know that Hogan was going to be the third member. So Hogan made it to Bash at the Beach and turned into a bad guy. Against his agent's wishes, Hulk Hogan felt that this could be the shot of adrenaline his WCW career needed. Hogan stood in the middle of the ring and called the fans trash while reminding them that they turned their back on Hulkamania. When he walked out wearing all black on Nitro, it really hit home for a lot of people that the unthinkable had happened. The American hero of wrestling wasn't a hero anymore. He had a real disdain for some of the fans that hung on to his every word back in the 80s and early 90s. Needless to say, Hulk Hogan turning heel and forming the New World Order with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall was the right move. Hogan became not only relevant again, but he became the talk of the entire wrestling industry. And you gotta think that Hulk Hogan, now known as Hollywood Hulk Hogan, was thinking of his bank balance as the headlines came rolling in from the wrestling magazines at the time. His mission now was to stay relevant while hoping that WCW shows would sell out and people would buy the pay-per-views at home. His financial interest in the success of WCW was just too great to ignore. So let's do what we normally do and take a look at the matches Hogan had during this time period. Hogan's very first match as the leader of the New World Order happened at WCW Hog Wild in 1996, where he defeated the Giant for the WCW Championship. This also saw the championship getting the NWO spray paint job for the very first time. The match is a slow paced affair, a lot of holes here which makes things a little flat. It is interesting though to watch Hogan work as a heel here after being such a huge draw as a babyface, so for this reason, the Hog Wild Championship match is still worth a watch. The Outsiders interfered to give Hogan the upper hand, and Mr. Brutus Beefcake, the booty man, Ed Leslie himself, got dropped by the NWO when he tried to present Hogan with a birthday cake. Hogan's first title defence was just five days later at Clash of the Champions 33, a match that saw the Hulkster defend the championship against nature boy Ric Flair. This one doesn't even reach the 10 minute mark and it was a little rough around the edges. When you watch this one you will quickly realise why this match isn't talked about all that much. Hogan even does his classic hugging up routine during this match as a heel, which made fans cheer for him. Definitely a bad move here, but anyway, the outsiders hit the ring and attack Flair, leading to the Horseman, Sting and Lex Luger running down for the save. This led to Hogan's next match in the NWO, a War Games match at Fall Brawl 1996. Hogan, Hall, Nash and the bogus NWO Sting defeated Arn Anderson, Lex Luger, Ric Flair and the real Sting in a good war games match that's definitely worth your time. I feel it was after the War Games match that Hulk Hogan finally became comfortable as a heel. His promos got better in the ring and his moveset changed also to complement his Hollywood Hogan character. It took a while, but Hogan had been so used to working as a babyface that sometimes he would still mount Hulkamania style comebacks and try to work from underneath. By the time Hogan got to his next match with old enemy and friend Macho Man Randy Savage, he had fine tuned his heel persona, but admittedly, this match here really wasn't that good. The Hogan vs Savage Halloween Havoc match in 1996 should have been spectacular, but it turned out to be one of those big fight field main events that kind of falls flat at nearly 20 minutes long. Hogan also decided to wear this wig, which has become meme worthy today, but those who followed WCW back then would remember that Hogan had mocked Savage about going bald in the build up to this match. 
pot, calling the cat all black hair for sure, but this was the reason why Hogan was wearing the wig. It was to make fun of Savage. Without the context, some people seem to think that this was Hogan actually trying a new look for himself. Anyway, the wig was soon removed during the match, even Randy Savage himself put it on for some giggles, and those who take the time to watch the match will know it was simply used as a gag. The match ends with shady referee Nick Patrick and the Giant making sure that Randy Savage has no chance of becoming the WCW Champion. This wasn't WrestleMania 5 by any means and if you want to see Hogan vs Savage, I'd recommend going back to 1989. After the match, Roddy Piper makes an appearance to set up the next big Hogan pay-per-view match. Two men who were in the WrestleMania 1 main event are going to square off at Starcade 1996. Before we get to Starcade though, I should mention that Hulk Hogan defended the WCW Championship against Lex Luger in a dark match on the 11th of November edition of WCW Nitro. Piper vs Hogan then at Starcade. We all blindly assumed that this match, the main event of Starcade 1996, which was billed as the match of the decade, would be for the WCW Championship. It wasn't. WCW never said it would be a championship match, but then again, they also didn't say that it wouldn't be for the WCW Championship either. We had no reason to think that Piper vs Hogan wouldn't be for WCW's top prize. Piper defeated Hogan and got a huge pop in the process, but the following night on Nitro, Hogan and Bischoff acted like the match never happened. Starcade 1996's main event was a complete throwaway match which, in Hogan and Eric Bischoff's minds, meant absolutely nothing. We won't get into the ins and outs of Starcade 1996. There's a story here that I'm sure could take up the remaining time on this video, but Piper vs Hogan at Starcade 96 is something I will come back to in the future. During mid to late 1996, the New World Order were easily the biggest thing going in professional wrestling. The wrestling world was legitimately buzzing when Hulk Hogan sided with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall at the 1996 Bash at the Beach pay-per-view, and WCW executive producer Eric Bischoff made sure to capitalise on the hottest storyline in professional wrestling by pushing the New World Order as WCW's main angle. Not only did Eric Bischoff create a team of bad guys who would never stop growing in numbers, and not only did Eric Bischoff create the most talked about wrestling storyline of the year, but Eric also created a brand with the New World Order. The NWO had its own distinctive look and feel, from the NWO logo itself becoming instantly recognisable not only in wrestling circles but in pop culture itself, to the New World Order's Jimi Hendrix sampled theme music. The NWO became more than just a faction and a storyline, the NWO became its own entity. It could seemingly exist outside of a Monday Night Wrestling show. Eric had, in many ways, hit the jackpot with the New World Order, and he wanted to not only generate revenue for Time Warner with his creation, but he wanted to turn the NWO into a media product. This went beyond your standard t-shirts and compilation videotapes. This went beyond action figures and posters. There were plans at one point to air a New World Order wrestling show that would coexist with WCW Nitro on TNT. You'll hear time and time again that the NWO added too many members, and while this may very well be true, there's an obvious reason behind it when you consider Eric's ultimate vision of having two separate brands in WCW and the New World Order. 
Long before Eric Bischoff changed WCW Nitro to NWO Nitro for a one-night experiment, Easy e tested the popularity of his creation by producing a pay-per-view event completely based around the New World Order. Happening on January 25th, 1997, NWO Sold Out was a spin-off pay-per-view that was completely clean of any WCW branding, a unique take on the pay-per-view attractions that Eric Bischoff was seeing success with over the past year or so. In Eric's mind, the New World Order had become so successful and so ingrained in contemporary wrestling that his NWO storyline and faction could host a pay-per-view that could attract both casual viewers and die-hard fans. Keep in mind here that the idea was to make people pay to see a show completely dedicated and branded towards a heel faction in professional wrestling. It was a risk worth taking. Eric understood the NWO was popular and he himself wouldn't be out of pocket if the whole thing turned out to be a disaster. People like to call out WCW and Eric Bischoff for putting on the sold out 1997 pay per view and while some criticisms do have merit, you have to respect Eric's decision to think outside the box in a relatively safe wrestling landscape, especially during late 1996 and early 1997. NWO sold out will never be anyone's favourite pay per view event but the idea, the concept and the risk factor I believe complements Eric Bischoff more than than disparages him. I will admit though that the actual event itself, from an in-ring perspective, left a lot to be desired. Eric Bischoff said, We experienced a tremendous amount of growth in 1996. We clearly knew we had lightning in a bottle, and the very basic idea of creating warring factions and eventually allowing NWO to have its own pay-per-views and special episodes of Nitro was something I started formulating and thinking about during the last half of 1996. We then didn't have the challenge of producing WCW Thunder. At this point, in January of 1997, that mission didn't exist. We had the NWO that was clearly at war with WCW, Kevin and Scott had came in and of course it started to build after that. Once it became obvious that this was becoming successful, the ideas already started ricocheting in my head that we were going to split the two brands. So take away the cool factor of the New World Order, take away the distinctive branding and take away all the buzz and all the hype. What the New World Order was, at its very core, was a group of bad guys in wrestling. Not only were they your typical heel wrestlers, but they were almost impossible to beat via pinfall or submission. Week after week, the New World Order would gain the upper hand on WCW's finest superstars through strength and numbers, underhanded ring tactics, even a dodgy referee which we will talk about a little more as this video progresses. If you're a younger wrestling fan, you maybe didn't care about this New World Order stuff, you didn't like the cheating and you cheered for the true babyfaces, you wanted to see the NWO get their comeuppance. On the flip side of this, if you're a die-hard wrestling fan who has been loyal since the Jim Crockett days, then you'd see the NWO as nothing more than a bunch of New York guys showing how skilled they are at collecting large paychecks for as little work as possible. Eric Bischoff may have struck gold from a television standpoint with the New World Order, but it was those die-hard fans who purchased pay-per-views, or it was the parents of the young casual fans. This was a pay-per-view focused around heels and wrestling. It becomes evident that it would be challenging trying to sell this kind of pay-per-view to the masses. Yes, there were WCW babyfaces that sold out, but the whole selling point itself was the New World Order. When questioned about the overall theme of NWO sold out, Eric said, in my perspective as a producer, this pay-per-view was a means to an end. It wasn't an end and it wasn't a blow-off pay-per-view. This pay-per-view was structured as a vehicle and means to further establish the war we were trying to create between WCW and NWO, and we checked that box. There wasn't a lot of storytelling here, it was all about building the characters and further establishing the distinction between WCW and NWO. 
Really, it was an experiment. We did a lot of things on this pay-per-view that we wouldn't have done on a more traditional show. If you back it up all the way to the very beginning, to when we launched Nitro in 1995, I wanted to be different from the WWF. I can't overemphasize the success Nitro and the NWO had in being completely different from the WWF and attracting a new audience because of it. Everything that we did that was successful was out of the box. This pay-per-view was my way of taking that to another level and experimenting. And like any experiment, sometimes you're successful and sometimes you fail. WCW and WWF pay-per-views had never been this targeted before. The overall theme of NWO Sold Out would be so different from anything that had aired on pay-per-view previously, and Eric wanted people to pay money to see, at its very core, a bunch of predominant New York bad guys in the spotlight. The true experiment here was in the branding and notoriety of the New World Order. Adding in that cool factor and the buzz around the NWO was the trump card in all of this. There was definitely reason to believe that NWO sold out could be a success by just riding on the wave of popularity. Eric was banking on fans literally buying into the hype. Cedar Rapids, Iowa, January 25th, 1997. Here we are at NWO Sold Out. It's a strange location choice. Eric Bischoff explained that booking arenas in areas that never really got live wrestling would be an easy way to move tickets, but that's also a double-edged sword for obvious reasons. There could be a very viable reason as to why wrestling doesn't sell well in certain locations, but anyway, NWO Sold Out is the biggest wrestling show ever to happen in Cedar Rapids, and that says a lot. To highlight how different this broadcast would be in comparison to traditional WCW pay-per-views, head booker Kevin Sullivan had absolutely nothing to do with the event. He was completely against the NWO expansion due to fears of overexposure. The show opens up with the NWO arriving to the venue in garbage trucks. Garbage trucks with NWO flags. This opening has been ridiculed by many and yeah, there's really no defending it. The whole NWO, led by Eric Bischoff, walk into the arena before a video package airs featuring Eric Bischoff giving a speech reminiscent of Citizen Kane. In this video, which I thought was actually done pretty well, Eric says, I stand before you today humbled by the premier event that's about to take place. We are in control. To those of you who have risen to the challenge and joined the ranks of the NWO to change the face of the professional wrestling world as we know it, to you I say thank you one and all. And to those of you who offered yourselves up as opponents, what the hell were you thinking? We then get a look at the arena for the first time and one thing I will say is that the arena looked fantastic for this show. The NWO branding was all over the place from the ring mats to the entranceway where TVs were set up showing the NWO logo. It all felt very different and this, as we just learned, was what Eric was aiming for. There's a sort of dystopian feel the NWO sold out that's hard to explain but the production staff done an incredible job of making the show look like nothing we'd seen before from WCW and WWF. Eric Bischoff introduces the three founding members of the New World Order. Hall, Nash and Hogan appear on three separate screens and this I felt was also a nice touch. I recently learned from Guy Evans' Nitro book that WCW senior editor Camper Rogers actually had to play three separate videos at just the right time to make it seem like the NWO were talking to each other. These days this wouldn't be any trouble of course so learning that little bit of information made me appreciate the opening even more. Anyway, from this point forward, NWO sold out would be filled with ups and downs. More downs than ups if I'm honest, but let's look at the entire show. Ted DiBiase and Eric Bischoff provide commentary for NWO Sold Out. There's no announce desk, just Eric and Ted sitting on some production boxes. Chris Jericho comes to the ring for his match against the man who made the NWO International, Masahiro Chono. Jericho doesn't have any theme music, he doesn't even have a lower third for his name to appear on the screen. Neil Pruitt, the guy who lends his voice to the following announcement promos, and the guy known as the voice of the New World Order, can 
can be heard making fun of Jericho as the Lionheart makes his way to the ring. This would be a common theme throughout the entire show. Nick Patrick is our referee for this match and he's in the NWO's back pocket so what we end up getting is a bunch of slow counts when Jericho tries to make a pin and yes, this would also be a common theme throughout the entire show. Nick Patrick would be instrumental in most of these sold out matches. The Chono vs Jericho match then is kind of symbolic of the NWO as a whole. Y2J brings the fight while Chono doesn't really seem to care at all, preferring to just get through the match and nothing more. Show up, do what you need to do and get to the back. During the match we see Harlem Heat, Arn Anderson and other WCW guys enter the building, sitting in the audience to cheer for the WCW guys. Jericho tries his best to get a match out of Chono but it's just not happening. There's a moment where Jericho is screaming for Chono to run the ropes and you can't help but feel that Jericho is legitimately fed up of doing all the work. The crowd then begins to chant USA which doesn't make any sense but anyway, Jericho hits a pinning German suplex but Nick Patrick performs a slow count. The audience boos loudly but the match just continues on. The same thing happens once again, Nick takes longer to hit the mat for the three count, and so you now understand what this pay per view is all about and why a lot of people don't like it. A top rope spot is then botched, Chono sets up a table on the outside, Jericho eventually gets sent through the table, Chono delivers the Yakuza kick and it's all over. Nick Patrick brags that Masahiro Chono is Japan's finest into the camera, and we have our first WCW vs NWO showdown in the bag. Chono vs Jericho sounds excellent on paper, it just didn't work, it sold out. Eric Bischoff tells us that there will be a Miss NWO contest and pictures are shown of some of the contestants who wanted to enter this beauty pageant. Bischoff later revealed that he sent staff out to find women who would eventually participate in the infamous contest and Eric specifically requested that his staff did not bring back supermodels. The Miss NWO contest is one of the things this show was remembered for. It was an absolute train wreck where Eric would end up kissing the winner on TV, a lady named Miss Becky, who looked like she could be Eric's mother. The Miss NWO segments that ran between each and every match were led by Jeff Katz. Who is Jeff Katz? I hear no one ask, but I'll tell you anyway. Jeff's father was an executive at New Line Cinema and a WCW events promoter wanted Eric to give Jeff a chance on TV. That's all there is to it really. And that's all I'm going to say about the Miss NWO stuff. The interviews were awkward, the ladies didn't look like they knew what they just signed up for. They just sat around the entranceway with some biker dudes and it just didn't work as a pay-per-view showcase. Eric Bischoff defended the beauty pageant by saying... It was designed to be the exact opposite of what people would expect the NWO to do. Everybody, including the Dave Meltzers of the world, would have probably booked the hottest girl they could find. I wanted to go the other way, and I did, and it didn't work. Anyone that's ever been in the business of actually producing television that will say to you they've never misjudged an audience is a liar, and they've never been there. Dave Meltzer falls into that category. Up next we have Hugh Morris versus the NWO's Big Bubba. For a little backstory, Big Bubba ended his association with the Dungeon of Doom to join the NWO and so Hugh Morris was out for revenge. Yes, the Dungeon of Doom stuff was still going on in 1997. Hugh Morris doesn't have any theme music either and Big Bubba comes down to the NWO B Team theme song, a theme we would hear quite a lot through this entire show. This was booked as a Mexican death match. Conan was originally supposed to wrestle in this match, but funnily enough, he wasn't able to leave Mexico to attend this show. Anyway, you'd quickly forget this was a Mexican death match because Nick Patrick threatens to disqualify Hugh Morris quite a few times. I understand he's an NWO referee, but still. This one here wasn't great either. Nick Patrick slow counted at every opportunity, robbing Hugh Morris of any chance of winning. In the end, Big Bubba runs Morris down with a motorbike on the entranceway and Nick Patrick suddenly wakes up, counting rather quickly to give Bubba the win. It's 2-0 to the NWO and we are treated to more awkward interviews from the Miss NWO hopefuls. 
Eric Bischoff promises more exciting action next. Jeff Jarrett versus Michael Wall Street. And again, it's a story about Nick Patrick. This show should have been called Nick Patrick Sold Out at this point. Nick puts his hands on Jarrett early on, physically forcing Double J away from Wall Street, and this leads to a bunch of stalling. Deborah McMichael is watching from the audience, and she grows concerned for Jarrett as the match progresses, clearly seeing Nick helping Wall Street at every given opportunity. Eventually, Deborah pleads for big Mongo McMichael to help Double J. Mongo hits Wall Street with the briefcase before telling Nick Patrick to make the three count. Although Patrick doesn't want to, he has no choice. Jeff gets the win, scoring the first pinfall victory for WCW. The problem here though is that absolutely no one cared about Jeff Jarrett, nor the outcome of this match. The first WCW victory couldn't mean any less in the eyes of fans. Next up, the American males explode as Scotty Riggs takes on Buff the Stuff Bagwell. It becomes apparent around this time of the show that the fans are getting bored with the action in the ring. Bagwell and Riggs goes close to 15 minutes here and it feels like an absolute eternity when watching this one back. Neil Pruitt, the NWO voiceover guy, calls Scotty Riggs a loser on the PA system during the match. This provides a little bit of entertainment but apart from that, this match really struggled with Bagwell leading the way for most of the bout. Guys like Bagwell and Riggs were really more conditioned for those snappy and quick television matches you'd see on WCW Saturday Night and WCW Nitro. Giving both men at the very most 7 to 8 minutes was already pushing it, so what you end up with here is a lot of time wasting. The guys really didn't know what to do to fill up time it seemed. Buff Bagwell gets the win with the blockbuster. You'll miss nothing of significance by skipping this match. Diamond Dallas Page takes on Scott Norton next, another match that sounds exceptional on paper, and a match I quite enjoyed, even though it was very short. Norton easily overpowers Page at the beginning of the bout, but DDP is able to outsmart Norton and bring him to the mat. As Norton begins to swing things back in his favour, the audience suddenly makes a lot of noise when we see Sting in the arena, watching the match from the crowd. Back to the match and Norton is dominating Page on the outside. The guys working the PA system are getting a little trigger happy with the loser soundbite. The novelty has already worn off. Page begins rallying back and after DDP hits a DDT, members of the NWB team come to the ring led by Buff Bagwell. Bagwell asks DDP to join the NWO, keep in mind that DDP already refused an offer on Nitro from the Outsiders that led to Scott Hall taking the diamond cutter. Page says he's in, he puts on the black and white colours and he shakes hands with Scott Norton. Page then pulls Norton in for a diamond cutter before running off into the audience, the exact same way he refused the Outsiders on Nitro. It gets the desired crowd response here at Sold Out though. Nick Patrick rules the match in Norton's favour, Page gets counted out. We get more Miss NWO nonsense before our next match. The Outsiders defending the WCW Tag Team titles against the Steiner Brothers. Out of all the New World Order members we have seen so far, in early 1997, maybe Hall and Nash were the only guys who were truly over in the United States. They brought a certain star power to the New World Order and so, this was really the first match that felt significant. It was a fun match too, not great by any means, it does get slower and slower as the match progresses, but in comparison to what we've just seen, and the calibre of superstars we have had on display, this match went a long way in waking the audience up a little, and on top of this, Hall and Nash seemed motivated here, something that many consider a rare sight during this era of WCW. Kevin Nash took some big bumps from Scott and Rick Steiner, doing an impressive sell job here for the Steiner brothers. The bout falls into familiar territory though as Rick Steiner needs to make the tag, he can't get to his corner, and you'd expect the fans in attendance the rally behind the suffering babyface, but it feels like the audience is a little underwhelmed at this point. 
Nick Patrick takes a bump, Rick and Scott Steiner get the better of Scott Hall while Nash is on the outside, and WCW referee Randy Anderson, who has been watching the show in the audience, jumps out of his seat to count the pinfall, new tag team champions are crowned at sold out, and the audience suddenly comes to life at this rather unpredictable outcome. Eric Bischoff said on commentary that this is a grave injustice and there will be consequences. The next night on Monday Nitro, Eric reversed the decision and the titles went back to the Outsiders. The best match of the show came up next, United States Champion Eddie Guerrero taking on 6 in a ladder match. You could always count on Eddie Guerrero to deliver the goods in WCW. Those of you who watched the Reliving the War series on my channel would know that Eddie worked hard in World Championship Wrestling and this match here is no exception. And say what you want about Sean Waltman, but when he was on, he was on. He could fly around the ring delivering a unique moveset and he could bump like a champion when needed. And also, he never really got lazy. Ladder matches were a rarity in WCW too, so this was a treat for fans who exclusively watched Turner's wrestling show. For those wondering, by the way, Six stole the US title, hence why he's wearing it while coming to the ring. High risk aerial offense, suplexes to the outside, the ladder coming into play and being used as a weapon. It's a great match all around here, and yes, it has been surpassed numerous times in the year that followed, but you have to remember that this is the beginning of 1997. With the correct mindset, you'll have fun with this one, and honestly, with the exception of the production of the show, it's one of the only essential reasons to check out NWO Sold Out. Both men unhooked the belt at the same time, Eddie hits six with the belt, and Guerrero wins the match. Eddie celebrates with the WCW superstars in the audience after the match. The winner of the Miss NWO contest is revealed and Eric Bischoff gives her a big sloppy kiss afterwards, you know because he wanted to be different than the WWF. Whatever you say Eric, whatever you say. This all went on way too long, nobody cared and it came across as embarrassing. Our main event features the Giant challenging Hulk Hogan for the WCW Championship. The Giant won the World War 3 Battle Royal in 96 and therefore he had earned a WCW title shot against Hulk Hogan. Hogan refused to give the Giant a title shot the night after Starcade and Hogan made fun of the Giant for losing to Lex Luger at the same pay per view. This all led to the Giant getting kicked out of the NWO and Hogan putting the title on the line, it sold out. To be honest, and I've said this before, but I don't think this Hogan vs Giant match is as bad as others make it out to be, at least in comparison to their previous matches. We had just sat through a painfully mediocre show at this point too, it's very difficult to get excited for Hogan vs Giant to end sold out, but try watching this one before watching everything else. Like the Outsiders, Hogan seemed motivated here, and while there is the standard story stalling to waste time and whatnot, there's still decent action here when things pick up. After some back and forth, Hogan hits the leg drop but the Giant gets back on his feet. The Giant hits the chokeslam and it looks like we have a new WCW champion. But then you remember that Nick Patrick is the referee for Sold Out. Patrick only counts to two, the Giant keeps pinning Hogan over and over again but Patrick simply refuses to count to three. The NWO then run to the ring but the Giant is able to take care of the heel faction. Hogan then uses a guitar that was passed to him by Eric Bischoff and the Giant gets destroyed. There's no bell to end the match so I think this was a no contest. Anyway, Giant gets NWO spray painted on his back, the audience chants we want Sting but the Stinger doesn't make an appearance. The show ends with Hulk Hogan playing air guitar with the WCW Championship and yeah, that was NWO sold out. With the experiment now in the bag, Eric Bischoff waited anxiously for the buy rate numbers and it must have been quite a blow when Eric got word that NWO sold out attracted only 170,000 pay per view buys. Not bad by today's standards you may think, but consider that Starcade drew 345,000 buys the month before and Super Brawl 7 the month after brought in 275,000 buys. You can instantly tell that the experiment didn't work. As a matter of fact, 
sold out was WCW's worst 1997 pay-per-view in terms of buy rate. It's not that Eric misjudged the popularity of the NWO, but Eric was asking fans to buy into a novel pay-per-view concept featuring a heel faction, and fans were very right to be wary of the show. Those who did buy sold out in 1997 were disappointed by the in-ring action. Only Six and Eddie Guerrero truly delivered a show-stealing performance, and word quickly spread that NWO sold out was a weak show filled with ridiculous one-side officiating and a weird beauty pageant. I said earlier that the arena looked good and the whole aura of the show was on point, but once you see that for the first five minutes, then you're left with what's in the ring, and the show just didn't deliver in that respect. Thankfully, Eric had the sense to think twice about putting on another NWO themed pay-per-view. On the very next episode of Nitro, we have the first televised Nitro match featuring Hulk Hogan since he had joined the NWO. Isn't that crazy when you think about it? Hogan had went from July 1996 all the way to the beginning of the new year without wrestling a single match on WCW's flagship TV show. Hogan worked a total of 11 Nitros in 1996, and every one was before the NWO even existed. When looking at match histories, you will also notice that while in WCW, Hulk liked to work the majority of his contracted Nitro dates in the first half of the year, seemingly getting these out of the way. This could also be poor foresight by Eric Bischoff too, but who knows. Of course, Hogan still showed up on Nitro and sometimes even got physical, but he was not obliged to work additional matches after he had wrestled the agreed amount in his contract. Additional matches would cost WCW additional money. Anyway, Hulk's first Nitro match of 1997 saw him lose to the Giant by DQ, and yes, the NWO interference is what led to the disqualification. Roddy Piper, the man who defeated Hulk at Starcade in a non-title match, got a chance to win the gold at Super Brawl 7 when he faced Hogan once again. Of course, Hogan won this match and capped his WCW Championship. After Team NWO defeated Team Piper and Team WCW at Uncensored, Hulk Hogan performed in a rare house show match where he put over hometown hero Jacques Rougeau in Montreal, Quebec. It was a non-title match of course, and the match is available in its entirety on YouTube. Hogan then used up more of his WCW Nitro dates by wrestling on the show two weeks in a row. Lex Luger defeated Hogan on the 9th of June episode, and the following week, Lex Luger and the Giant defeated Hogan and Dennis Rodman by disqualification. A quick match here which was done to get some last minute sales for the next pay per view, Bash at the Beach. Bash at the Beach 1997 was also the one year anniversary of the NWO formation, and the main event was once again the Giant and Lex Luger taking on Dennis Rodman and Hulk Hogan, a match that Hogan and Rodman lost. For those unaware, Dennis Rodman was brought into WCW with the sole intention of getting the company more media attention. He didn't care about wrestling at all, but also, he couldn't turn down the money that was offered. In total, Dennis Rodman earned over $1.5 million for the dates he worked for WCW over 1997 and 1998. And so, this ends year one of Hulk Hogan in the NWO. Remember those bonuses and incentives that were written into Hulk's contract? Well, let's just say that WCW became extremely successful during this time period. The New World Order became the hottest thing in wrestling, more people tuned into Nitro, more people bought the pay-per-views, and more people attended shows. WCW was gearing up for Starcade in 1997, which would feature Hulk Hogan vs Sting in the main event, and thanks to the build-up for this particular match, Starcade would also be the most financially successful pay-per-view in WCW's history, and if WCW was financially successful, so was Hulk Hogan. The night after Bash at the Beach, Lex Luger challenged Hulk Hogan to a future WCW title match. Hulk Hogan wasn't in the building, he had the night off, but it looked like WCW was going to go with a Lex Luger vs Hulk Hogan main event at the next pay-per-view, Road Wild. Hogan formally accepted Luger's challenge the next week on Nitro. The Hulkster said he would break Luger in Sturgis as he lay down in the middle of the ring with Eric Bischoff by his side. Before getting to Road Wild though, we need to stop off at the August 4th 
1997 edition of Nitro, the special 100th edition of the landmark Monday Night Wrestling Show. To celebrate the occasion, Nitro ran for three hours, and to pop a rating and to get fans to tune in, it was decided that Hulk Hogan would defend his title against Luger. Keep in mind that Road Wild was happening later in the week, Hogan vs Luger was still booked for the pay-per-view, so fans were going to see the total package versus the Hulkster twice in one week. In the Nitro main event, Lex Luger put Hogan in the torture rack and Hogan submitted. That's right, Hogan lost the WCW Heavyweight Championship to Lex Luger on a weekly wrestling show. The crowd response was absolutely insane here too. It's one of the better moments in Nitro history, and after winning the WCW title, Luger took the belt backstage where the NWO spray paint was removed from the Heavyweight Championship. If we knows Hogan like we knows Hogan, then the smart money says that the World Heavyweight Championship was going straight back to the Hulkster at Road Wild. And of course, this is exactly what happened. Luger's big moment on Nitro was completely negated when the Hulkster won the title back in Sturgis. A fake sting cost Luger the championship in a pretty mediocre match. And the ending of Road Wild 1997 left a really sour taste as fans realised that Luger's title win was empty and and pointless. Say what you want about Lex Luger, but he was over during this time period. Even a month or two with the world title would have sufficed, but after all was said and done, we were right back to where we started. At this point, WCW was looking forward to Starcade and the in-ring return of Sting. JJ Dillon had been offering Sting match contracts that JJ felt would appease the Stinger, but Sting only wanted to face one man, and that was Hulk Hogan. Eric Bischoff wanted to build the inevitable match as slow as possible, and in order to do this, Hogan would have to face other opponents in the run-up to Starcade. Immediately following Road Wild, Hogan didn't work a single televised match until Halloween Havoc 97, and even then, the WCW title wasn't on the line. Everything was secondary here when compared to the Hogan vs Sting rivalry, and I just want to point out that I'm not bashing the creative decision at all here, it was smart and it was the right thing to do. The WCW title wasn't defended at Halloween Havoc because Roddy Piper was booked to beat Hollywood Hogan inside a steel cage. A bunch of bogus stings stood around the cage watching the match, and the show ended with Piper taking a beating from both Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage after Hot Rod scored the victory. When Eric Bischoff decided to create the New World Order faction within professional wrestling, he never envisioned the faction having a true ending. He of course knew in the back of his mind that one day it would all come to a close because really everything has to come to an end eventually, especially within the professional wrestling landscape. When Ted Turner requested an additional WCW TV show for his network however, any ideas of ending the NWO faction were completely forgotten about. It simply was was no longer an option for consideration. WCW Thunder on Thursday nights created an incredible problem for Eric Bischoff in WCW Wrestling. Not only was Eric stretched to his limits with Nitro and his energy sopping rivalry with Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation, but Bischoff was dealing with a tremendous amount of big name talent. He was keeping egos in check, trying to keep creative in some sort of order, keeping WCW profitable. And I really do believe that Eric Bischoff sometimes doesn't get enough credit for for the work he undertook during the Monday Night Wars. With the creation of Thunder though, Eric had a few ideas, a few plans that were actually pretty radical in terms of originality. Eric wanted to make Thunder a strict World Championship Wrestling show and he wanted to change WCW Monday Nitro to NWO Monday Nitro. You can see why any thoughts of wrapping up the New World Order storyline were completely out of the question. Eric Bischoff said, 
The NWO were supposed to take over Nitro and WCW were going to have Thunder. That was the strategy. The strategy wasn't to put an end to the NWO. The strategy was how do I create NWO to be its own unique and distinct brand and its own show. There was never a desire to put an end to the NWO, there was never a reason to put an end to it. There was a desire and reason to try and build it as its own brand so it could sustain a kind of brand position within a WCW program. When the Thunder discussions began happening, any thoughts of how do we end the NWO storyline went out the window and it became more like, okay, we have this juggernaut called the NWO, how do we best take advantage of it and how do we best utilise it? The decision was made for NWO to get Nitro and WCW gets Thunder. That was the goal. When it comes to the success of WCW during those fabled 83 weeks of the Monday Night War, it's ridiculous to downplay how important the New World Order really was. We all know that Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and Hollywood Hogan had their own agendas, no one is arguing that, but that doesn't mean the storyline wasn't a success, it was a massive success, even with the weird booking, the indecisive match finishes, the fact that the NWO put a limited amount of superstars over, the New World Order were still the hottest thing in wrestling. The NWO though were also so far removed from the traditions of world championship wrestling and the company's roots in Georgia, there was still old school fans of WCW who felt that the NWO was nothing more than a bunch of New York guys coming in and collecting a paycheck. And there's also a lot of truth to that. During the glory days of the Monday Night War, you had guys like Ric Flair and the Horsemen and Sting who would fight for the traditions of world championship wrestling and plenty of fans got behind their old favourites. Noticing that fans were effectively cheering for both the NWO and the babyfaces of WCW, and noticing that the NWO branding held a lot of weight during the mid to late 90s, Eric Bischoff's initial knee-jerk reaction was to change WCW Nitro to NWO Nitro. A lot of people, including the wrestling media, criticise Eric Bischoff for this move, but when the common complaints of modern wrestling always centre around everything being the same and wrestling having a real lack of originality these days, well Eric Bischoff's idea should be at least praised for being very outside the box and something completely different. It was a ballsy move, Eric truly felt that the popularity of the NWO could sustain a weekly show and traditional fans of World Championship Wrestling could be kept happy with a WCW exclusive show known as Thunder. We can only assume that there'd be crossovers between both shows and it's all very hypothetical in terms of how this would work, we can only guess what was going to happen, but fortunately there was a test run of NWO Nitro that aired on TNT, and today we're going to take a look at this broadcast to see how it all went down. The very first episode of WCW Thunder took place on January 8th, 1998, and the pilot episode of NWO Nitro happened just two weeks prior. At the time, WCW Nitro was a three-hour broadcast, and to try and ease viewers into this new wrestling experience, the decision was made to air a more traditional first hour of WCW action before transforming the show for the final two hours. It all happened on December 22nd, 1997, six days before WCW's biggest grossing show in history, Starcade 97. You have to believe too that this was strategic. To give credit, the whole Sting vs Hogan angle had been built up very very well and WCW had a serious amount of viewership going into Starcade. Putting on NWO Nitro before Starcade would expose an insane amount of fans to this new directive and it would also provide WCW with an incredible amount of feedback. Eric also really did believe that fans would enjoy it, he felt the new world order was established enough to take over an entire TV show, and keep in mind that this was 11 months after the ill-fated NWO sold out pay-per-view. Whether Eric had more faith in his creation at this point, who knows, but at the end of the day, Eric had to try and do something. The Thunder program was a huge headache that wouldn't go away, so Bischoff was seriously hoping that fans would buy into NWO Nitro as the future of his flagship Monday Night Wrestling show. And as ballsy as this move was, you can't help but thinking back to sold out in January and how badly that pay-per-view was received. 
The show kicks off with the Nitro Girls doing a dance routine as Tony Schiavone announces that Eric Bischoff has some sort of surprises in store tonight. That's right, NWO Nitro was just completely sprung on the fans. There was no announcement, it wasn't advertised at all, and this too was a strategic move. WCW Nitro was already a proven success with a track record of high viewership. Announcing a change this big could have potentially hurt that viewership. So while it was a little sneaky, it also made sense sense to test this out in front of a regular WCW viewing audience. Now, that's not to say that a complete NWO takeover of Nitro wasn't hinted at or mentioned in storylines, it very much was. Eric Bischoff was wrestling Larry Zbysko at Starcade 97, and if Bischoff won, the NWO would gain full control of Nitro. So the concept of a new Nitro broadcast with the New World Order was definitely a proposition, at least in storylines. The first 60 minutes of this Nitro, though, was pretty standard. The commentary team done a lot of work to build up Starcade. We had Eddie Guerrero vs Fit Finley, Ming vs Steve McMichael, Van Hammer vs Chris Benoit. We had promos from The Giant and Dallas Page, all seemed pretty standard. After the Benoit match, NWO members Rick Rude, Buff Bagwell, Vincent, Scott Norton and Conan paid a visit to the commentary desk. Shivani, Mike Tanay and Larry Zbysko disappeared, and the NWO began handing out New World Order t-shirts to the production staff, some of which couldn't act as of their lives, a few were seen smiling at this hostile takeover. The NWO made the production crew remove WCW Nitro logos away from the set. Conan went into the production truck and he gave out more NWO shirts while asking if the staff were with the NWO or not. Basically, the New World Order were bullying people into doing their dirty work. Even the arena banners were taken down and NWO Nitro banners were used as replacements. This was pretty cool, but I do have two small complaints. The first being that really, it should have been Hall, Nash and Hogan calling the shots here. And also, the whole dismantling of the Nitro set went on for over 10 minutes. Doesn't sound like much, I know, but it seems like an eternity when you're watching it. To end the rebranding of Monday Nitro, a giant metal block with the NWO Nitro logo gets lowered down from the ceiling, covering the entranceway. And then a new intro is played for the NWO portion of the show. The intro shows an unnamed man destroying the WCW Nitro logo and replacing it with the new NWO version and we see grainy clips of the New World Order in action. The destruction of the classic Nitro set is pretty much what everyone remembers about this episode of Nitro, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's take a look at the remainder of the show. The first segment is, of course, an NWO promo. Eric Bischoff comes down to the ring riding a motorcycle, and Eric welcomes the fans to NWO Nitro. Eric then introduces the New World Order, a long entrance takes place, and Bischoff announces that he has some early Christmas presents for Hulk Hogan. As NWO Nitro propaganda falls from the ceiling, not one but two motorcycles are delivered to the Hulkster. Hogan is overjoyed, he can't believe what the NWO have done for him. That's not all though, Hollywood Hogan gets a convertible limousine, hot tub and women included. Rick Steiner was then scheduled to face Scott Norton in a one on one match. JJ Dillon tells Rick that he doesn't need to go out there and perform, but Rick and his manager Ted DiBiase decide to go ahead with the matchup. The Steiner's music plays in the arena as Eric Bischoff, Rick Rude and Kevin Nash take over on commentary duties, and we see a replay from last week's action. You can see here that the replays use that grainy black and white NWO filter, WCW trying to make this Nitro feel different in every way possible. A new screen overlay is used to introduce the competitors, and during the match we can hear the voice of Neil Pruitt with his classic New World Order sound bites, very reminiscent of NWO Soul out here. The match ends in a disqualification when Conan gets involved, Scotty Steiner ends up helping brother Rick, Vincent and Ray Trailer get involved and yeah the match is over, nothing special at all here. Kevin Nash takes a little time to make fun of his upcoming opponent at Starcade, the Giant. Funnily enough, this match wouldn't happen. Nash apparently went to hospital because he feared he was suffering from a possible heart attack. Moving on, Disco Inferno comes to the ring, dancing and ripping up the NWO flyers on the floor, and he'll be facing Kurt Hennig tonight. Kurt is putting his US title on the line. When the match begins, Rick Rude says that Kurt Hennig is 
toying with this boy. And Eric Bischoff tells Rick to be careful, he might end up getting sued. Good stuff. Hennig pretty much dominates the entire match. The audience gets a little excited when Disco shows some signs of life, but by and large, this was incredibly one-sided. Bischoff and Nash talked about how NWO Nitro will be the new standard beginning on the 29th of December. Nash praises the video producers for putting together the intro to the show, and Bischoff says that NWO Nitro will only feature the most elite superstars of professional wrestling. The bout ends with the perfect plex, and after the match, Bobby Heenan makes his way to the commentary desk. Bobby pleads with Eric Bischoff to be part of NWO Nitro. The brain says that Eric Bischoff is a winner, the NWO are winners, and throughout his whole broadcasting career, Heenan has always been with the winning team. Eric Bischoff gets tired of Bobby's groveling and Kevin Nash ends up giving Heenan his spot on the commentary table. The next match doesn't feature any NWO guys at all, it's Harlem Heat versus The Flocks, Scotty Riggs and Lodi. Rick Rude actually takes some time to praise Booker T and Stevie Ray, kinda strange to hear but it's also refreshing. Bischoff leaves the commentary desk also during the match and Mike Tanay is brought back, so Rick Rude is the only NWO member left on commentary. Harlem Heat get the win, decent enough match, nothing more to say. Lionheart Chris Jericho takes on Buff the Stuff Bagwell next. Bagwell is his usual cocky self, while Jericho looks like he'd rather be anywhere else than on this NWO Nitro show. Still, Jericho fires up early, getting a chance to show off his athletic abilities, and this one actually turns into quite a good TV match. Jericho flies around the ring while Buff tries to slow things down on the mat. Bagwell does quite well in getting some cheap heat from the audience while Jericho continues to impress with his fast fast paced offense throughout the bout. The match ends with the blockbuster, Buff Bagwell scores the win although Chris Jericho completely carried the match from an in-ring perspective. Buff was good at getting the audience to boo him but Jericho brought the action. Next up is yet another NWO promo, the whole group comes to the ring once again to bestow more gifts on Hulk Hogan. The Hulkster gets a WCW world title ring, Easy e says that this is an exact replica by the way, and Eric even gets down on one knee to give Hogan the ring, announcing that Hogan is the champion of the world. Hogan's famous Sports Illustrated cover is displayed for all to see, along with a photo from Rocky III. Thunderlips is choking out Rocky Balboa as the audience begins chanting for Rocky. And that's another segment over, it seems that NW Nitro is all about giving presents to the Hulkster, what a great night he's having. Next up is the NWO Nitro main event, Lex Luger vs Randy Savage, and I'm sure a lot of you who watch Reliving the War are maybe a little surprised that Luger and Savage were still feuding with each other way into late 97, but yeah, this rivalry would start and stop numerous times and the two men would make up and break up often. Randy dedicates the match to Hulk Hogan, so let's see if the Macho Man can give the Hulkster another present by defeating the Total Package. Things don't start out very well for the Macho Man as Lex Luger goes full throttle. Luger brings the fight to Savage while stopping every now and then to fluff up his hair. Honestly, Luger done this constantly during this time period and it shouldn't annoy me, but it really does. Savage is eventually able to lay in a few punches before choking Lex with his boot. The fight spills to the outside and Lex is able to get the upper hand after fighting with Savage and the audience. Back inside the ring, Lex hits Savage with a series of clotheslines, Luger goes for the bionic elbow, and the Macho Man moves out of the way while referee Randy Anderson gets nailed. Lex fixes his hair before delivering a Gorilla Press slam, Savage hides behind Elizabeth on the outside, and this allows Buff Bagwell to hit the total package from behind. Kevin Nash ends up hitting the ring and Luger takes the jackknife, a big elbow from Randy Savage follows and the Macho Man scores the win. Really, there was no other way this match was going to end anyway, and anyone who watched main event Nitro matches that featured the NWO would know that run-ins were pretty much expected. 
The final segment of NWO Nitro then, take a guess who it includes. Of course, it's Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan once again. Three separate promos featuring these guys in one night. Granted, this was the final segment before the Starcade Hogan vs Sting match, so it made sense here, but still it is a little too much. I suspect some people will remember this one though. The Hulkster begins talking about Starcade and how the pressure was on Sting to bring his A game for the biggest match in WCW history. Some guy brings another present to Hollywood. Eric Bischoff is confused. Easy E thinks this must be a gift from Scott Hall or Kevin Nash. Just then, Bret Hart shows up in the NWO limousine. Bret would be refereeing the Bischoff vs Sabisco match at Starcade, and Hogan then opens up his gift. It contains his own severed head. Hogan's reaction here is comical, and it's made worse by the complete silence of the audience. I think too many people were busy wondering why Bret Hart had just showed up to even care about the Hulkster standing there holding his own fucking head. Just then, Sting appears from the top of the entranceway, and the Stinger zip lines to the ring as Nitro goes off the air. We don't get to see any more, the screen fades to black as Sting approaches the ring. Tune into Starcade 1997 to see what happens next. So the experiment that was NWO Nitro was now complete. It was time to get a little feedback and see if this test run could be made into a weekly show. WCW Nitro was in the middle of their winning streak against Monday Night Raw, so no need to worry about beating the WWF in the ratings, but man, it was very close. Nitro drew a 3.5 while Raw drew a 3.1. To give some context here, the Nitro from the week prior drew a 4.1 and the Nitro that aired the week after this NWO edition scored a 4.6. Now you also have to consider that NWO Nitro aired as fans were getting prepared for the Christmas holidays. Viewing habits would naturally change around this time of year, but WCW dropped quite close here to WWF Raw levels, and this NWO Nitro episode drew WCW's lowest rating since July of 97, when the company were typically around that 3.5 area. WCW had done well to break the 4 mark, and NW Nitro seemingly dropped them right back down. When Nitro went back to normal, they bounced right back up into the 4s, so in short, NW Nitro was not a rating success, and fans seemingly tuned out to watch WWF Raw. The moment fans tuned over to Raw was when the NWO began dismantling the Nitro set, and as mentioned earlier, I do feel that this went on way too long. Fans switched over to Raw and they didn't return, and this will get covered way down the line in the Reliving the War series on this channel, but over on Raw, we had the infamous Shawn Michaels vs Triple H European title match. There was a large portion of fans who wanted to see what happened with D-Generation X on this night, and not another NWO takeover, and I find that kinda interesting. Needless to say, the wrestling media didn't care much for NWO Nitro either. The Observer seems to be one of the only outlets that gets archived these days, and Uncle Dave said what we would all naturally assume. There would be a lot of second guessing around turning WCW Nitro into NWO Nitro. So you know how the story ends really, WCW Nitro continued as it was. Zabisco defeated Bischoff at Starcade, the Sting vs Hogan match ended with controversy and things just carried on as normal. Eric rethought his Thunder strategy and he planned to give Thunder its own set of big stars, but that didn't work either. Thunder ended up becoming a C show that didn't draw very well in comparison to the Monday Night Wrestling shows. Still, as mentioned earlier, you have to respect the effort here and the philosophy around thinking outside the box. NW Nitro may not have resonated well with fans and on TV, the planning and organisation of the NW Takeover could have been handled a little better. Fans didn't really care to see the NW setting up their own entranceway and whatnot. Think about this too, if Eric did announce that the 22nd of December edition of WCW Nitro would have a complete NW theme, 
then there's a very high chance that fans wouldn't have tuned in to begin with and the ratings winning streak could have ended a lot earlier. So it was smart to try this unannounced, even if it did make a lot of viewers switch over. It was still a bad outcome, but it could have been way worse. I do respect the risk-taking aspect of it though. Keep in mind that NW Nitro was an experiment, it was a test, it may have produced bad results, but at least it was something different. And it would be nice if someone out there in WWE land would try doing something different with their own product today. Thank you very much for watching. Hollywood Hogan vs Sting at Starcade was made official during a contract signing held in late October of 97. Fans would have to wait around two months before seeing one of the most hyped matches in wrestling history take place at the Starcade show. WCW World War 3 took place on the 23rd of November 97 and Hulk Hogan was part of the World War Battle Royal. The Hulkster appeared towards the end of the match as a surprise entrant and an elaborate NWO plan led to Scott Hall winning the Battle Royal. But let's just fast forward to Starcade then, the biggest match in WCW history and a night that would end up filled with controversy. I've talked about this main event before in a previous video and I've gone over the finer details of the match and the build up so I'll keep things as brief as possible here. I'll start by saying that the Hulk Hogan and Sting entrances at Starcade 97 are absolutely phenomenal. The atmosphere in the arena is electric and the whole 18 month build up finally coming to an end really does make for a grand spectacle. I do believe that Sting maybe should have came down from the rafters and I think it was a mistake having the stinger just walk on out there like any other competitor but still this didn't stop the Starcade main event from feeling like a really big deal. This type of spectacle is something that WCW struggled to achieve during the mid 90s but Eric Bischoff and company completely nailed it at Starcade. The term big fight feel is so overused in modern wrestling and it's a term that's just slapped onto any main event these days but Sting vs Hogan really had that big fight feel and and it's hard for me to think of a match in WCW afterwards that had the same energy. When the bell rings though, things begin sinking pretty quickly. I think we all expected more, but in the end, Hogan vs Sting was just passable. Again, I'm not going to go over the details, but Hulk Hogan pinned Sting at the end of the match, and Sting's shoulders were counted to the mat. Bret Hart then showed up and he ordered the match to continue with the Hitman as the new referee. Sting then applied the Scorpion Death and Sting was crowned the new WCW champion. It was a mess, Nick Patrick's three count was supposed to be fast but it wasn't. It looked like Hulk Hogan actually got robbed and the match never should have been restarted but what's done is done. You can learn more about this in my Starcade 97 video and I'll include a link at the end of the video. The next night on Monday Nitro, the controversy surrounding Starcade was addressed. Hogan argued that Nick Patrick was supposed to be the one and only official involved in the Starcade main event and Hogan also said that Patrick ordered for the bell to be rung and therefore the Hulkster should still be the world champion. Sting ended up issuing an open challenge to any NWO member on the same episode of Nitro and Hulk Hogan accepted the challenge. There was no decisive finish here, Nitro went off the air as Sting hit the Stinger splash accidentally hitting the referee at the same time. Fans had to tune in next week to see what was going on and in classic WCW fashion, JJ Dillon said on the next episode of Nitro that fans would need to check out the debut episode of Thunder to get the latest news on the World Heavyweight title. So on the January 8th 1998 episode of Thunder, Sting was forced to vacate the championship. The two men had another match at Super Brawl 8 and Sting was able to defeat Hulk Hogan to once again and become WCW champion. Randy Savage hit Hulk Hogan with a spray can while the NWO tried to attack Sting and this led to the mega powers exploding once again. Hogan would move into a rivalry with Randy Savage that would eventually lead to the complete split of the new world order. 
Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan had been having problems in the run up to Super Brawl, yet Savage remained a member of the New World Order. When Savage cost Hogan the title in the Sting main event, all bets were now off and Hogan wanted to face the Macho Man at the uncensored pay per view inside a steel cage. Billed as a power struggle between two NWO members, Hogan and Savage ended again in typical WCW fashion without a clear winner. The Disciple interfered to help Hogan and this led to Sting coming down to assist Savage, but the Macho Man attacked the Stinger before leaving the cage. This brings us to Spring Stampede then. Hulk Hogan teamed up with Kevin Nash to take on the Giant and Roddy Piper. Kevin Nash had also been having problems with Hogan recently and this resulted in Hollywood attacking Nash at the end of their tag team match. Later in the evening, Randy Savage had a title match with the Stinger and thanks to interference from Kevin Nash, Randy Savage became the new WCW champion. The next night on Nitro, Hogan challenged Savage for the title, saying that Savage and Nash had worked together to keep the belt away from the Hulkster. Even though Kevin Nash got a little payback for the bat attack at Spring Stampede, Hulk Hogan ended up becoming a four-time WCW champion thanks to Bret Hart jumping in. This business with Nash and Savage though resulted in irreparable damage being caused to the New World Order, both in storyline and in reality, and this resulted in a splinter group known as as the NWO Wolfpack being formed. Kevin Nash led the red and black version of the NWO while Hogan maintained the black and white faction. And the main storyline that would dominate the coming months within WCW was the war between the NWO Wolfpack and NWO Hollywood. So the NWO Wolfpack, the red and black version of the NWO, the more hip and contemporary group that was created due to infighting within the NWO. Either you loved the Wolfpack or you just didn't care. Looking back now, it's kind of weird that we accepted these middle aged dudes trying to act like gangster rappers, wearing baggy clothes and entering the ring to hip hop music. But it was a different time, a different place and hey it's wrestling, anything can work. So how did the Wolfpack come to be? Scott Hall was the man who referred to himself, Six and Kevin Nash as the Wolfpack during 1997. The best way to compare this would probably be how the Elite were members within the Bullet Club faction at one point. In 1997 there was no official red and black Wolfpack but Nash, Hall and Six still referred to themselves as such. Check out the episode of Nitro on the 28th of April 1997 to see the first time Scott Hall called the trio the Wolfpack. Towards the end of 1997, the huge Sting and Hollywood Hogan build would be seeing its payoff when the pair met in the ring at Starcade 1997. Sting left Starcade 97 as the WCW champion but had to vacate the title due to the controversy surrounding the win. Hulk Hogan would get another shot at the Stinger, and this is when the problems began happening within the NWO. Before moving forward, you have to remember throughout this video that the NWO was a huge faction. It was actually way too big. What started off as Nash, Hall and Hogan grew into a huge gang in a matter of months. Of course, with this many NWO members, some would get irritated, both on screen and off screen, that they weren't getting their proper time to shine. One of those members was Macho Man Randy Savage. At Super Brawl 8, Hulk Hogan lost to Sting in a match for the vacated WCW World Heavyweight Championship and was attacked by Macho Man Randy Savage late in the match. After Super Brawl, Savage then made his intentions clear and declared that he no longer needed the NWO's help to win matches. He also said that Hulk Hogan had dropped the ball in reclaiming the WCW title and he was going to go after Sting to try and bring the championship back to the New World Order. Meanwhile, Sean Waltman, who had been out injured since October of 1997, was released from his contract and sent to rehab. Shortly thereafter, his click buddy Scott Hall was removed from television. This all led to a confrontation between Kevin Nash, Eric Bischoff and Hogan on the March 26th episode of Thunder when Hulk Hogan famously said that Six couldn't cut the mustard. 
Six then returned to the WWF four days later as X-Pac and returned the favour, saying that if Hall and Nash were able to do so, they would be joining Waltman in the WWF and in DX. Eric Bischoff replied to X-Pac on Nitro, simply saying, Bite me. With all this going on, Kevin Nash also noticed that Hulk Hogan was all about himself and not about the greater good of the NWO. On top of this, he was not happy with how his friend Six was treated by Eric Bischoff. With this in mind, Nash and Hogan were still NWO teammates and they had a big match coming up where they would need to put their differences aside. They were successful in doing so at Spring Stampede, where Hogan and Nash defeated Roddy Piper and the Giant, but after the match, Hogan orchestrated a beatdown on his tag partner. Later in the night, Kevin helped Macho Man Randy Savage defeat Sting, earning Savage the win, which in turn made Randy Savage the new WCW champion. Hogan came out following the match, not pleased at all while arguing that Savage had his title. Hogan and the Disciple then attacked Nash and Savage to close out the show. Hogan regained the WCW title the next night on Nitro in typical WCW fashion. The match between Savage and Hogan was booked with a no run-in stipulation, but of course, there were a lot of run-ins. In the end, Bret the Hitman Hart helped Hulk Hogan capture the WCW title. During all of this feuding between Hogan, Savage and Nash, the other NWO members would soon have a decision to make. Do they side with Hulk Hogan or do they side with Nash and Savage? Kevin Nash has since said that the NWO was split because he and Hogan had legitimate heat with each other backstage and the pair didn't want to work with each other anymore, mainly due to creative differences. Eric Bischoff, however, has said that the NWO needed to split due to having too many members. WCW Thunder was originally planned to be a straight WCW show and Monday Nitro was going to be an NWO exclusive show. However, plans changed after the abysmal NWO Nitro episode that did air in place of a traditional WCW Nitro show was a complete failure. On top of this, the NWO themed sold out pay-per-view also didn't draw the kind of numbers Bischoff had hoped. Whatever story you care to believe, the NWO was indeed going to split, which is actually quite telling of the state that the NWO managed to get itself into. On the May 4th episode of Nitro, Nash, Savage and Conan appeared wearing black shirts with a red NWO logo. They called themselves the NWO Wolfpack and soon they were joined by Kurt Hennig, Rick Rude, Dusty Rhodes and Miss Elizabeth. This new branch of the NWO would work as baby faces, while Hogan's side still worked as bad guys, wearing the classic black and white NWO colours. Hogan's side would be renamed NWO Hollywood and would feature Eric Bischoff, Brian Adams, Scott Norton, Vincent and The Disciple. Oddly, Bret Hart would not align himself officially with NWO Hollywood, but was named as the recruiter for the black and white heels. Scott Hall had been out with an injury but due to return at May's Slamboree pay-per-view. The obvious assumption was that Scott Hall was joining the Red and Black Wolfpack and he and Nash were scheduled to defend the WCW tag titles against Sting and the Giant. The Giant joined NW Hollywood shortly before Slamboree but also remained loyal to the Stinger. That said, the Giant was the first person to suggest to Sting that he needs to choose an alliance among the NWO factions and WCW. At Slamboree, Hall made his return to WCW in the colours of the Wolfpack as he teamed with Kevin Nash. During the match however, Hall turned on his long serving outsider tag partner by hitting him with the title belt, which gave the win to Sting and the Giant. The next night on Nitro, Hall was introduced as the newest member of NWO Hollywood. Lex Luger would join the Wolfpack and urge his friend Sting to do the same on the May 25th edition of Nitro in 1998. At the same time though, NW Hollywood were also trying to secure the services of Sting. Sting revealed his decision on the following week's Nitro, where we all thought Sting had done the unthinkable and joined forces with Hulk Hogan, only to rip off the black and white NW shirt he was wearing to reveal a red and black one underneath. Sting was now officially a member of the NW Wolfpack and he would replace his black and white attire and face paint to the red and black. 
This would probably be a good time to talk about the image of the Wolfpack along with the theme music. The Wolfpack came out to a hip hop song with lyrics such as Don't turn your back on the Wolfpack, you might wind up in a body bag. It was a cool song for sure. The NWO members also acted like wannabe gangster rappers, wearing loose fitting clothes, bopping their heads as they walked to the ring and using the Wolfpack or the click hand gesture like a gang sign. Now bear with me here, but looking at the main demographic of the viewers who enjoy this channel, I can tell that half of you guys watching would have been in your late teens or early into adulthood when the NWO Wolfpack were in full swing, just like myself. So for a lot of us guys, the Wolfpack styling gimmick was pretty acceptable back in the day. But man, looking back at the Wolfpack these days is... It's, it's hard to put in the words. The sight of Lex Luger and Kevin Nash trying to show their street cred in later life is kinda like watching that embarrassing drunk uncle at the party. For its time though, NWO Wolfpack was popular, no doubt about that. Just watch some old Nitros and you can see how over they were. But looking back now, it also definitely hasn't aged that well at all. The music is still cool, the red and black logo is still cool. But honestly, go back and watch some Wolfpack promos these days. Still destroys a Baron Corbin promo though, but anyway, let's move on. Kurt Hennig and Rick Rude would soon defect the NWO Hollywood, leaving the Wolfpack a few members down at the Great American Bash. On the same night, Sting won the WCW tag titles and chose Nash as his tag partner. The two would go on to defend the titles. Over on the NWO Hollywood side, Hogan would drop the WCW title to rising star Goldberg on a historic edition of Monday Nitro. The Hulkster would then involve himself in celebrity matches including the likes of Dennis Rodman, Carl Malone and Jay Leno. Nash continued to feud with his old buddy Scott Hall. Hall and the Giant got a tag title shot at Sting and Nash on the July 20th episode of Nitro, which Hall and the Giant won after interference from NWO black and white recruiter Bret Hart. The Nash vs Hall feud came to an end at Halloween Havoc when Nash walked out of the ring and Hall got a count out win. Nash stated that he didn't want to fight his old friend and he wanted the pair to become buddies again. This was on the same night that Hogan faced the Warrior in one of the most brutally bad matches to ever grace a wrestling ring. Many people forget though that Bret Hart also defeated NWO Wolfpack member Sting on this same night. Nash would go on to win the 60 man World War 3 match to secure himself a title shot against Goldberg. Meanwhile, at the World War 3 pay per view, Scott Hall would get kicked out of NWO Hollywood. Hulk Hogan soon announced his retirement from pro wrestling and Scott Steiner became the leader of the black and white NWO. During mid-1998, the New World Order faction in WCW had split in two. There was the NWO Black and White, led by Hulk Hogan, and there was the NWO Wolfpack, led by Kevin Nash. The NWO storyline had been a major success for WCW after the summer of 1996, but by the time we got to mid-98, things were getting a little stale. The group had expanded in a big way, and this led to the overall impact of the New World Order getting watered down. The NWO Wolfpack did freshen things up a little and fans were receptive to the red and black version of the NWO, but the New World Order in general felt like a tired idea that WCW was running into the ground. On the flip side of this, 1998 was a pivotal year for the World Wrestling Federation. WrestleMania 14 had ushered in the Stone Cold era, with Steve Austin becoming the WWF Champion, and Vince McMahon had decided to update his wrestling organisation to a much more contemporary product. The WWF were full of fresh ideas while WCW were seemingly stuck with the NWO in their main event picture. There was an exception though, there was one man who was making a lot of noise in WCW. He had no affiliation with the NWO, he wasn't an old WWF guy, and he was booked in such a unique manner that fans had no option but to pay attention. That man was Bill Goldberg. Goldberg seemingly done the impossible in 1998 WCW. He was able to break into the main event scene while guys like Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan were at the top of the mountain. 
On the July 6th, 1998 episode of WCW Nitro in front of a record audience inside the Georgia Dome, the undefeated Bill Goldberg became the WCW World Heavyweight Champion after defeating Hollywood Hulk Hogan. This ended up being the single most profitable episode of WCW Nitro ever, and it's a real moment in WCW history that you just have to see for yourself. Words can't do it justice. Something I'd like you to keep in mind throughout the entirety of this video though is that Hulk Hogan signed a new contract with WCW shortly before this episode of Nitro, so the creative control clause was also kept intact. This is important and we'll circle back to this later. With the world title now on Goldberg, Hulk Hogan would shift his focus onto other competitors such as the Ultimate Warrior, and the Hulkster would eventually tease a retirement from wrestling while running for president. Starcade 1998 was headlined by WCW Champion Bill Goldberg versus Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash. After a little assistance from Disco Inferno, Bam Bam Bigelow and Scott Hall and his trusty taser, Kevin Nash done the unthinkable, he ended Goldberg's winning streak. Many fans today question this decision and again we'll talk about this in the second half of the video, but it's insane how many people bash this outcome without watching the footage. The audience inside the MCI Centre in Washington DC go absolutely crazy when Nash wins the belt. Granted, fans are probably cheering due to the shock of seeing Goldberg take his very first WCW loss, and empty pops like this evidently don't mean a lot in the long run, but for all the complaints directed at Kevin Nash due to the Starcade 98 finish, no one can say that the crowd weren't extremely excited when Goldberg got beat. So to keep the timeline of events fresh, NWO Black and White leader Hulk Hogan was the WCW champion going into the Georgia Dome on the 6th of July 1998. He was defeated by the unbeatable Goldberg on a live episode of Nitro and Goldberg became the champion. And then on the 27th of December 1998, NWO Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash beat Goldberg, ending Goldberg's run as WCW champion and also ending Goldberg's long winning streak. Nitro was in Baltimore the next night and Kevin Nash was annoyed that his win at Starcade had an asterisk beside it thanks to Disco Inferno and Scott Hall getting involved. Big Sexy came to the ring and he announced that Goldberg will get his rematch the following week on Nitro which, ironically enough, would be inside the Georgia Dome, the same venue where Goldberg won the title from Hulk Hogan back in July. So we arrive at the 4th of January, the very first Nitro of 1999. During the first half of of the show, Bill Goldberg got arrested. We didn't know what the charges were, but it looked like the Nash vs Goldberg match was in jeopardy. Kevin Nash was visibly upset about this turn of events, while Hulk Hogan, who was scheduled to make an appearance on Nitro, seemed pleased with what happened. Hogan said that if Goldberg was a criminal, then he deserved to go to jail. Remember, Hogan was doing his phony presidential campaign during this time period. As it turned out, Miss Elizabeth was accusing Goldberg of stalking her. Kevin Nash came out of the arena saying that if Miss Elizabeth is behind Goldberg going to jail then Hulk Hogan is obviously pulling the strings. Nash asks Ric Flair, the WCW president at the time, for a warm up match against Hogan. Nash said that Goldberg would get cleared before the end of Nitro and the Nash vs Goldberg rematch will still happen later in the night, but Big Sexy wants a piece of Hulk Hogan in the meantime. Ric Flair agrees, so the fans in attendance are kind of expecting two Kevin Nash matches on Nitro this evening, and the WCW title would be on the line in both matches. Hulk Hogan comes out for an interview and he agrees to the match also, saying that he's going to beat Kevin Nash while retiring from wrestling as the world champion. After the promo, Tony Schiavone told fans what was going to happen over on Raw in the main event. Tony told WCW viewers that Mick Foley was going to win the WWF title, and he sarcastically said that that should put a lot of butts in seats. We'll come back to this a little later too. Miss Elizabeth admits that she made the accusations up and Bill Goldberg arranges a drive back to the Georgia Dome. Meanwhile, it's time for Hogan vs Nash. 
Hogan comes out with NWO Hollywood member Scotty Steiner and something I just want to point out here, it's been reported time and time again that fans didn't want to see Hogan vs Nash here tonight, but look at the audience, they're dancing, fans are actually dancing in the arena before the scheduled match. You notice things like this quite a lot when you take the time to go back and do your research instead of reading reports or reading books or even watching WWE produced documentaries. Kevin Nash comes out to a great ovation but the audience goes nuts when Scott Hall follows. Scott Hall walks out wearing the NWO Wolfpack colours. Hogan and Nash are now in the squared circle and the two men circle around the ring for a little to waste some TV time. Nash mocks Hogan by ripping off his shirt in classic Hulkamania style. The audience is at a fever pitch and let's cut to the chase. Yes. finger poke of doom. It was all an elaborate scheme. Hulk Hogan just won the World Heavyweight Championship and it was a big plan all along to reunite the NWO while bringing the belt back to Hollywood Hogan. Goldberg shows up after finally making it to the arena. Keep in mind that Tony Schiavone said earlier in the broadcast that the police station was just across the road by the way and Bill Goldberg storms the ring to take out the NWO. Things were going well until Hogan hit Goldberg with the title belt but Goldberg was able to spear the Hulkster. Lex Luger then showed up and we thought Luger was going to help Goldberg but instead the total package assists Hogan. Goldberg takes a beating in the ring, the planned Nash vs Goldberg match has obviously been axed and the show goes off the air with Kevin Nash saying to the camera, can you say deja vu? The NWO had reformed and this would be the birth of the NWO Elite. Okay, that's the first part out of the way, you now know what happened on TV. Now it's time to look at some behind the scenes aspects and look at how the finger poke of doom truly affected WCW. Let's first tackle one of the biggest questions. Why did Kevin Nash beat Goldberg and who made the decision to end Goldberg's streak? The common story we hear is that Kevin Nash had taken over his head booker in WCW before Starcade and he booked himself to end the streak and win the title. From what I've gathered, Kevin Nash was indeed on the booking committee in some capacity and he did have the ability to throw out ideas, but the final decision still came down to Eric Bischoff. Kevin Nash, along with Diamond Dallas Page, had had become what was described as idea men. They had sit in creative meetings and give input but they didn't have any kind of final say. It all came down to Eric Bischoff in the end but Eric admits that his creative team during this time period were a bunch of yes men. Eric said I don't know whose idea it was and it's impossible for me to tell you. Other than a few creative beats that I know for a fact were mine, 98% of the things you saw on TV were a collaboration from a bunch of different people, so it's really hard to pinpoint who raised their hand and said Kevin Nash should beat Goldberg. It might have been Kevin but it was probably someone else. Kevin was hesitant. He had seen what happened when Ric Flair was the booker and when Flair was booking for himself. It made sense then because he was Flair but Ric also got a lot of hate for it. It's a bad position to be in. I doubt it was Kevin's idea but when I heard it I went with it. How do you keep the streak alive when there's nobody left? So Eric basically says that Nash could have came up with the idea but he doubts it. Eric also confirms that he okayed the angle and Eric did indeed have the final say so that's done. Kevin Sullivan who was also on the committee at the time said Eric and Kevin were doing a lot of the booking. It might have been Eric's call, it might have been Kevin's call, it might have been somebody else's call but when they gave me the finish I said please don't do it this way. Sullivan pretty much washes his hands of the whole thing yet he still doesn't say whose idea it was. Kevin Nash himself said People wanted to see Goldberg get beat but when he got beat they went oh I'm not sure I wanted to see that. That's only because of the 15 run-ins, the cattle prods. If we went toe to toe and if I had beaten Goldberg with the power bomb, I would have been a god. The whole thing was designed to put together a faction to oppose Goldberg. It was the old school Hulk Hogan philosophy, build a team of heels that Goldberg could fight for 8 months. That's the way it was laid out. 
Anybody that knows Kevin Nash knows that I'm a pretty smart guy. If I'm going to beat Bill Goldberg after 172 wins in a row, I'm sure as f not going to turn around the next Monday, do a finger poke of doom and hand the belt to Hulk Hogan. What did that do for Kevin Nash? What did Goldberg's streak do for Kevin Nash? Now, if I'm going to book myself, I'm going to go on a 173 win streak and dodge Goldberg as a heel. And so Kevin Nash also says that the booking decisions around Starcade also didn't come from Big Sexy himself. Nash makes a great point too, when you really think about it, Nash came out of the whole ordeal looking like a chump. Yes, he did end the streak, but to hand his achievement for doing so to Hulk Hogan really didn't do Kevin any favours in terms of perception. The key phrase that Kevin Nash said though was Hulk Hogan philosophy. When we look at Hogan's history with the WCW Championship, the finger poke of doom has Hogan's fingerprints all over it, excuse the pun. Kevin Nash pretty much confirmed this during an internet at Q&A days later when he said, Until Hulk Hogan completely retires from professional wrestling, he's the man. He can make your life in this business very easy if you're on his team. His money and his power can make your life a whole lot easier. You can either jump aboard his express, earn a ton of money and live an easy life, or try to fight him like I did for almost a year and not get used. You're not going to beat him politically, you're just not going to be able to function in a company when he's on top unless you're on his team. It's a business decision and it's the right decision. Honestly, my theory here is that Hogan wanted to win the belt back in the Georgia Dome after dropping it six months prior in the same venue. The creative team, including Kevin Nash, had come up with this idea to appease Hulk Hogan. Remember, creative control. So a bad decision was made to have Kevin Nash win the title and then Nash lays down a week later for Hulk Hogan. You may wonder why Hulk just didn't beat Goldberg at Starcade, and it's a good question, but keep in mind that Hogan was only contracted for a certain amount of matches per year and Starcade was right at the end of 1998. This could also explain why the finger poke of doom didn't happen the night after Starcade. Hogan's last match before the finger poke of doom was the atrocious Halloween Havoc showdown with the ultimate warrior and that was months prior. Plus Goldberg had already beat Hogan. Kevin Nash vs Goldberg at Starcade was legitimately the first time the two men stepped into the ring in a one on one match. And then there's the NBC WCW special that no one mentions. WCW were negotiating with NBC to air a special event in a prime time television slot on Valentine's Day along with more specials down the road. After their success with WWE Saturday night's main event, NBC reportedly wanted Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage in the main event for the first special. This explains why Randy Savage returned the week prior and then didn't show up again until April. And this explains why Hogan came out of his quote retirement earlier than scheduled. If NBC wanted Hogan and Savage, then it's very possible that Hogan and indeed WCW wanted the Hulkster to main event the show with the WCW belt. The specials though never took place. The first special was to fill a hole in NBC's broadcast schedule when the NBA All-Star game was cancelled due to the 98-99 season lockout. But in the end, Harvey Schiller told Eric Bischoff that Turner higher-ups were not very keen on NBC making profits from a Turner broadcasting franchise. And when the NBA eventually returned to NBC after the lockout, the deal completely fell apart and WCW did not not appear on the network. If all of this was the reason for Hogan getting the belt, then you have to appreciate the irony and the finger poke of doom happening on TV when, in the end, it was absolutely unnecessary. Hogan possibly won the belt in preparation for an event that didn't even happen. As bad as the finger poke of doom was, WCW airing on NBC could have led to a significant boost in viewership. Still, this all doesn't change the fact that the finger poke of doom was a poor book decision. It's just a shame that we can't pinpoint who definitively came up with the Nash vs Goldberg finish and we can't pinpoint who came up with the finger poke of doom angle. No matter what stories I've read online or the books that I've read, if neither Bischoff, Sullivan or Nash can confirm whose idea it was, then to me we will never know who came up with one of the most infamous moments in WCW history. 
There's been a lot said about how fans switched over to Raw when Tony Schiavone announced on Nitro that Mick Foley was going to win the WWF title. Around 600,000 fans, not a million, 600,000, turned over to Raw from Nitro to see the title change. There's no doubt that this was a catastrophic blunder, but as mentioned in Guy Evans' Nitro book, the only book that contains painstaking research into the subject, along with sources within TBS, a total of 2.3 million viewers joined the TBS TNT broadcast during the Goldberg run-in at the end of the show. This was due to Nitro running a few minutes later than Raw of course, this was an Eric Bischoff tactic that done well to capture extra numbers before and after Raw went on the air. No doubt about it though, announcing that there would be a new WWF champion crowned on the opposing show was a really bad move. It was a free advertisement and a free invite for fans to switch over and see something special. No matter how many viewers WCW got at the end of the Nitro broadcast it was still a big mistake to announce what would happen on Raw. And remember too that fans who actually decided to stay with Nitro were treated to the Nash vs Hogan match. If there was ever a case of getting caught with your trousers down then this was it. There's a giant misconception though that this whole episode of Nitro drove fans away and there was no recovery afterwards. Like this was the only reason WCW went down the toilet. But this is a very, very big generalization that's been put forward to make the downfall of WCW seem more glamorous. To try and blame the decline on a single entering moment on Nitro and it's absurd to do so. Consider this, the January 4th 1999 episode of Nitro was behind Raw with a 5.0 to the WWF's 5.7, but the ratings in the weeks that followed actually showed that there was still some interest in an NWO reformation. WCW Thunder was able to achieve record ratings immediately following the incident, drawing in ratings around the 2.5 area for the first time ever in January and February, and Nitro maintained the same viewership it had done immediately before and after the finger poke of doom, even recording another two 5.0 ratings in the month of January. Sure, the WWF were now beginning to destroy Nitro, but it wasn't until late April that the steady and consistent WCW decline truly began. By that time, Hogan had already dropped the title. So the evidence clearly shows that the finger poke of doom was not the sole reason for WCW's decline. It's clear that it was a mixture of the WWF becoming a better product, WCW and Eric Bischoff being forced to change Nitro's content due to pressure from Turner executives, rendering the company unable to compete with the WWF's edgier product. And also, it was due to WCW going to the well once too often. The NWO storyline had run its course by early 99 and people wanted to see something new and exciting, content that the WWF was offering at the time. WWF Raw was simply a better show than WCW Nitro. WCW fans were tired of getting burned too, with weak finishes and scheduled matches is not even happening, a fine example being the night of the finger poke of doom. A lot of fans paid to see Nash vs Goldberg as advertised and they didn't get that in the end. With that being said though, the same amount of fans would continue to tune into Nitro for weeks after the finger poke of doom. It had no immediate effect, contrary to what everyone seems to publish on websites. Following the finger poke of doom incident in WCW, the New World Order faction went through another change. The NWO Wolfpack and the NWO Black and White had been at war with each other but when Hulk Hogan joined forces with Kevin Nash after the finger poke of doom, the NWO went through a kind of reboot that was supposed to bring the faction back to its glory days. What we got instead was a messy and sometimes confusing reiteration of the groundbreaking group, this time known as is the NWO Elite, or more specifically, the NWO Wolfpack Elite. Today's video will look at the group's entire run, which was thankfully quite short lived, and we'll also take a look at how the NWO era in WCW came to an end. As a heads up, my previous Finger Poke of Doom video would serve as a good introduction to this video. It kind of sets the stage for what was to come. The NWO Elite is a hot mess for sure, but hopefully by the end of this upload, you'll understand why this version of the New World Order spelled the end of an era for WCW. 
Our story begins then on WCW Thunder, January 7th, 1999, the episode after the infamous finger poke of doom. Tony Schiavone, Bobby Heenan and Mike Tanay kick the show off by calling Hogan and Nash's actions on Nitro appalling and the World Heavyweight Championship had been disgraced. WCW kayfabe president Ric Flair came to the ring and he sent a message to Kevin Nash. Flair said in 10 years time, Nash will have to look at his kid and he'll have to tell the story story of how he lay down in the middle of the ring for Hulk Hogan. Flair says that he knows who Hulk Hogan is. Flair was destined to walk behind Hogan since the day the Hulkster walked into WCW and the Nature Boy takes a jab at the Hulkster by naming guys like Dory Funk Jr, Jack Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes, Ronnie Garvin, Terry Funk and Harley Race as true champions of wrestling. Hogan and Nash are going to pay the price, we just had to wait and see how the Nature Boy was going to go about it. Members of the NWO Black and White were waiting for the arrival of Hulk Hogan backstage. Keep in mind that Scott Steiner had been the leader of NWO Hollywood during Hogan's absence and Steiner had also sided with Kevin Nash after the finger poke of doom, so no one knew what was going on here with the New World Order. Were they still at war with each other? Were Hogan and Steiner now Wolfpack members? Hogan showed up wearing, well, wearing this and he was also wearing the Wolfpack colours. Scott Steiner, Scott Hall, Buff Bagwell, Lex Luger and Kevin Nash were also wearing red and black. The Giant approached Hogan asking what was going on. Hogan said he would address the state of the NWO in the ring and he asked the black and white to watch his back backstage. NWO Hollywood agreed. Later in the show, the LWO Psychosis had a match with Billy Kidman and after the Latino World Order showed up, the Wolfpack made an appearance. Psychosis and Juventud Guerrera got the LWO shirts ripped off their backs as Kevin Nash grabbed the microphone. Big Sexy said he couldn't believe that Ric Flair would speak badly about the classic Hogan vs Nash match that took place on Nitro. Hogan says that the has-been world champions of WCW couldn't face facts. The NWO Wolfpack had set a new standard and the Wolfpack now runs the show. Just then, the NWO Black and White showed up and the Giant wanted answers. The Giant said that the Wolfpack left the Black and White backstage while this beatdown of the LWO took place and the Giant feels like the Black and White are playing second fiddle to Hogan and the Wolfpack. Hogan said that he's cool with the Black and White but he's not cool with the Giant calling him out in the middle of the ring. The Hulkster says that the NWO are trimming the fat and there's only room for one Giant in the faction, claiming that Kevin Nash is the true big man of the New World Order. And so a match was booked for Nitro the following week. If the Giant can beat Kevin Nash, Nash, then the Giant can take Nash's spot in the NWO. So yeah, it's a mess here, but at the same time, this all sounds very familiar. There's guys wearing red and black, guys wearing black and white, Hogan is claiming there's no divide in the NWO, yet the Wolfpack is still used as a faction name. There's supposed to be unity, but the Giant is facing Kevin Nash on Nitro. There's more questions than answers. On the following episode of Nitro, Hulk Hogan and the Wolfpack showed up in a limousine along with the Hells Angels and once again the NWO Black and White were left out. Hogan tries to tell Scott Norton that the whole group was supposed to arrive together and there was some sort of timing issue but the guys don't buy it. What you're seeing here, this whole thing with the NWO Black and White getting treated like lesser members of the faction, this would pretty much remain intact throughout this NWO Elite run. Guys wearing the white and black shirts would become known as the NWO B team, basically they were the mid to lower card players of the New World Order, a group of guys who nobody really cared about including WCW management. Anyway, Hogan gets into the ring and he says he'll take on anyone, Nash says he'll prove he's the real giant in the main event, really there's nothing special going on. Kevin Nash won his match later in the evening and so the giant was kicked out of the New World Order. Earlier in the evening, Conan was kicked out of the Wolfpack 2 when he tried to defend Rey Mysterio from Lex Luger. And you may be wondering where Sting was during all of this. Remember Sting was a member of the Wolfpack but unfortunately Sting was out with an injury and he missed out on all of this. 
On the January 25th episode of Nitro, the show opened up with NWO Black and White members Kurt Hennig and Stevie Ray discussing the NWO Elite. Kurt says that Nash and Hogan are trying to push the Black and White away, and Stevie agrees. Stevie and Kurt talk to the other members of the B team, and Stevie Ray announces that he's going to talk to Hulk Hogan about the problems within the New World Order. When the NWO Elite arrived in their private jet, Stevie Ray ran to Hulk Hogan and he said that Kurt Hennig had refused to put on his NWO colours. The NWO Elite and the NWO B team then gave Kurt Hennig a beating and Kurt was kicked out of the NWO. Stevie Ray thought this would have been enough to secure him a little bit of status within the NWO Elite, but instead he was thrown right back into the black and white team having to catch a ride with Vincent instead of riding in a limousine with Hulk Hogan. At least there was a little sense being shown here, removing members of the New World Order was absolutely necessary and I'm surprised there was an NWOB team at all. The minor leagues of the New World Order served no purpose whatsoever. While simultaneously working out all these issues among themselves, the NWO's main rivals inside the ring were the Four Horsemen and Bill Goldberg. Kevin Nash stated in interviews that the NWO Elite's main purpose in WCW was to have a faction that Goldberg could destroy over an extended period of time. But like most things in WCW during this time period, long-term booking plans quickly went down the toilet. The NWO B team continued to feel like second-class citizens in comparison to the elite, while the elite began seeing the black and white NWO as more of a hindrance than anything else. You may be thinking to yourself that this was all leading to something, but let me just ruin it for you, it didn't. The February 8th episode of Nitro saw Hulk Hogan approaching separate NWO black and white members and telling each one that they were the leader of the B team, and two weeks later every member of the black and white claimed to be the leader while they argued among themselves. This went on for weeks before Finally, Stevie Ray became the leader. Stevie Ray won a bottle royal that featured other NWO B team members, making him one of the more unremarkable leaders of the New World Order. Let's go back then and refocus on the Elite, because really, you don't need to know anything else about the NWO Black and White. Hogan's first title defense after the finger poke of doom was against Roddy Piper on the February 15th episode of Nitro. Piper won via DQ when Scott Hall interfered. Later in the week at Super Brawl 9, the nature boy Ric Flair squared off with the Hulkster once again on WCW television, and the world title was on the line. The match ended when a masked man came to the ring and tasted Greg Flair, Hulk Hogan got the pinfall win, and the masked man was revealed to be none other than David Flair, Rick's son. Absolutely nobody cared about this revelation. The audience didn't boo, they didn't cheer, they just didn't care. David also looked incredibly out of place as a member of the NWO, and I know it's not like you needed to be a high caliber superstar to join the New World Order, as evidenced by some of the guys who were already in the group, but David Flair made some of the NWO B team members look like absolute superstars. And what's more, David was wearing the Wolfpack Elite colours. In saying that, Disco Inferno was also a member of the Red and Black, and many people felt that he didn't belong either. Remember what I said earlier about how it was good that the NWO had gotten rid of some members? Well, yeah, they were all replaced. Ric Flair challenged Hulk Hogan to a steel cage match at Uncensored 99 for the world title. At the pay-per-view, Hogan dropped the title and Flair became a 14-time world champion. It was another match filled with Hulk Hogan nonsense, that old he beat me but he didn't really beat me stuff that Hogan played near every time he had to drop the belt. The match was supposed to be a first blood cage match, no pinfalls of course, and even though Hogan tried to pin Flair numerous times, Charles Robinson wouldn't count Flair's shoulders to the mat naturally. But Flair won the match with a fast three count, even though both men were already busted open. And so, just like Starcade 97, it looked like Hogan got ripped off. It was more of the Hulk Hogan bullshit that continued to tarnish the reputation of both the main event scene and the World Heavyweight title, and fans were now getting fed up with it. The same thing happened the next night on Nitro during a tag team match. 
Charles Robinson simply refused to count Flair's shoulders to the mat during a tag team match. Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell then had a falling out, so we have some infighting going on with the NWO Elite. Where have we seen this before? It looked like we were going to see another feud between Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan as evidenced on the March 29th, 99 episode of Nitro. Hulk Hogan was seen talking to Tori Wilson and the Hulkster said that he could beat Kevin Nash again if he wanted to. We wouldn't find out what was really supposed to happen though as Hulk Hogan got injured at the next pay-per-view, an injury that's still debated to this day because, well, it's Hulk Hogan. The man called Sting made his WCW return on the 5th of April. April 99, he was no longer affiliated with the Wolfpack and it was announced that Sting would get a shot at Ric Flair's WCW title along with Diamond Dallas Page and Hulk Hogan. A four corners match was set up at Spring Stampede 99, one of WCW's last really good pay-per-views and whoever won the match would be crowned the new heavyweight champion. Diamond Dallas Page got the win but during the match, Page put Hogan in a figure four around the ring post leading to Hogan being being unable to continue the match. In my opinion, Hogan knew he needed to have surgery and this was used to write him off TV for a while. It would also explain why the main event was a fatal four-way match and it also explains why Hogan had nothing but tag team matches since the uncensored cage bout. Also at Spring Stampede, Goldberg got revenge on Kevin Nash by beating him in a singles match and Disco Inferno also had his last match as a member of the NWO. Clearly, things were falling apart. Part. Scott Hall suffered a food injury that put him on the bench until October, Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner were fighting among each other and Big Papa Pump would soon end up sidelined with a back injury, Lex Luger had suffered a bicep injury that would keep him out of in-ring competition until September and now Hulk Hogan was taking a break. In terms of big name superstars, all that was really left was Kevin Nash which is quite ironic seeing as Nash gets labelled as injury prone. With Luger, Hogan, Hall and eventually Scott Steiner all out with injuries, the future of the NWO looked seriously bleak. There was of course the NWO B team, but the Wolfpack had done an incredible job in making the B team look like mid carters that it would have been ridiculous to raise these guys up into the main event. In storyline, Kevin Nash blamed Diamond Dallas Page, the WCW champion, for putting Hogan out of action. A title match was booked for Slamboree, Big Sexy vs DDP, and Kevin Nash won the match. Being 1999 WCW, the win wasn't without controversy. Macho Man Randy Savage interfered in the match and originally Nash won via disqualification. Eric Bischoff restarted the bout and Nash ultimately picked up the title after delivering the jackknife powerbomb. As the weeks went on, then the NWO Wolfpack became a memory, the only holdover being the fact that Kevin Nash would still come out to the Wolfpack theme music. The NWO B team would still get featured on TV, but they too began to slowly distance themselves from the NWO name. It seemed like WCW was now free from the New World Order, but still, the television ratings continued to drop. Kevin Nash dropped the WCW title at Bash at the Beach in July in a tag team match. Nash teamed up with Sting to take on Sid Vicious and Randy Savage and because Savage got the pinfall victory over Nash, the Macho Man became the new WCW champion. The very next night, Hulk Hogan made his return to WCW and the Hulkster was wearing an NWO shirt. The Hulkster accepted an open challenge from Randy Savage for the world title. Kevin Nash, wearing an outsider shirt, helped Hogan win the WCW champion later in the evening. So yes, Hogan came back from injury and he reclaimed his WCW title on his very first night back in the company. This wasn't an NWO reunion however, after the match Kevin Nash told Hogan that he wants him in the ring and he wants to win the title from Hogan. The Kevin Nash vs Hulk Hogan match wasn't something that WCW had tapped into yet, at least not without finger pokes and all that nonsense, so the next week Kevin Nash aligned himself with Rick Steiner and Sid 
Dead Vicious, and a match between Hogan and Nash was made official for Road Wild 99, a WCW championship match where the loser would be forced into retirement. On the August 9th episode of Nitro, Nash, Sid and Rick Steiner were scheduled to take on Goldberg, Hogan and Sting, and Hogan's American Made theme played in the arena as the audience wondered what was going on. Out walked Hulk Hogan, once again wearing the red and yellow attire for the first time since 1996. At the Road Wild pay-per-view, Hogan successfully retained the world title, meaning Kevin Nash had to retire. This being wrestling, the retirement didn't last long. Hogan dropped the WCW title to Sting at Fall Brawl 99. The Stinger turned heel at the end of the match by using a baseball bat against good guy Hulk Hogan. Sting also had help from Sid Vicious, Lex Luger and Diamond Dallas Page, so it's as far away from a clean finish as humanly possible. During the same time period, WCW was going through some big changes backstage. Eric Bischoff was getting phased out while Vince Russo was getting brought in, and Russo felt that Hulk Hogan should take a break from WCW and apparently no time frame was given to Hogan in regards to his return. In Hogan's book, which I know isn't a great source, Hogan said he had reservations about taking time off but he eventually agreed to do so. In a fine example of Vince Russo's booking style, Hogan showed up at Halloween Havoc 99 to face Sting for the world title, only Hogan lay down in the middle of the ring, allowing the Stinger to pin Hulk and successfully retain the title. There's been many different reasons given as to why this happened. A common theory is that Russo wanted Hogan to lose in under a minute, but Hogan refused, preferring to lay down in the ring instead. Another theory is that this was done to repackage Hulk in the future for a feud with the powers that be in WCW. Who knows? People seem to dismiss Hogan's creative control clause here, and I'm not sure why. It's to my understanding that Hogan could legally say he didn't want to do the match if he didn't want to do the match, but it really doesn't matter. The end result was another slap in the face to WCW fans who paid for a ticket to see Hogan vs Sting. That's going to do it for today because the next phase of the NWO has already been covered. NWO 2000 is on the channel and I'll leave a link at the end of the video for you to check out. Truly though, the NWO's glory days in the company were completely gone by the time the NWO Elite was formed. Initially, fans stuck around to see how it would all pan out, but by April of 99, less and less viewers began tuning into Nitro as the NWO infighting became more and more confusing. WCW, to their credit, did try a few new things, such as putting the title on Diamond Dallas Page, but in typical WCW fashion, they reverted right back and things became familiar again, for example another Hogan vs Savage rivalry. Vince Russo tried to revive the New World Order with the NWO 2000, but the true era of the New World Order dominating WCW Nitro was now completely over. The NWO 2000 was never going to recapture the feeling of a hostile takeover, and the NWO 2000 was never going to bring back those viewers who switched over to Raw. Things would get even more strange for Hulk Hogan and WCW after Halloween Havoc, and next time we'll look at Hogan's exit from World Championship Wrestling, along with the infamous Bash at the Beach 2000 incident. Thank you for watching. paid for by the New World Order. The New World Order had brought a huge amount of success to WCW during the mid-90s. The storyline and faction had helped Eric Bischoff and World Championship Wrestling become the number one wrestling promotion in the United States, but it can be easily argued that the NWO was also severely overexposed and overused. There had been so many NWO group reintroductions that it got confusing for casual fans. NWO Black and White, The Wolf Pack, there was the NWO Beat 
team NWO Japan, the NWO Elite, the three-man stable of Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and Hulk Hogan had morphed into a spider's web of guys who had their own feuds going on both inside and outside the faction. It became fairly obvious that the WCW higher-ups, including the main event NWO guys, didn't want to let go of their meal ticket even when the storyline was dead in the water. It's telling that WCW didn't book a giant blow-off match or angle for the NWO in mid 1999, the end of the New World Order could have maybe brought back some interest, but instead, NWO members kinda drifted off and the New World Order brand was there one week and then it was gone the next. To sum it up, the NWO were victims of their own success. Still, there was one last effort to bring the NWO back to WCW towards the end of 1999, a last ditch effort to strip the faction down to the bare bones and reboot the entire storyline that gave WCW an incredible edge over the competition. This video then will look at the creation of NWO 2000. On October 3, 1999, Vince Russo signed with WCW. Russo had been a member of the WWF creative team and the executives at WCW thought that Russo could carry over some of that WWF success by making Russo the head writer at World Championship Wrestling. We all know how that turned out. I don't think I need to talk about Vince Russo's success at television production within WCW, but interestingly, Vince Russo said that one of the very first things he wanted to do in WCW was make Brad Hart the top guy. When Bret Hart showed up in WCW towards the end of 1997, after the Montreal screw job took place, the company were presented with an unbelievable opportunity to build a captivating storyline and angle around the hitman. Many thought the whole company should begin evolving around Bret, striking the iron while it's hot in order to maximise potential viewership and media attention. But instead, WCW and Eric Bischoff completely blew it when it came to Bret Hart's first month within the company. Bischoff blames Brett, Brett blames Bischoff, but it really comes down to WCW being WCW. No new guys were going to come in and disrupt this NWO money train, no matter how good they were or where they came from. Bischoff simply thought that if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and this lack of forward thinking could be applied to many different factors that led to the ultimate demise of World Championship Wrestling. Still, when Russo came into the company to take over as the head of creative, among all the other wild ideas he had, Vince wanted to put Bret Hart on a pedestal and make the hitman a true main eventer of WCW. Russo said, he was huge. One of the things I noticed when I went to WCW was that they didn't know how to use Brett. They just didn't know how to use him. And I had so much respect for this guy from working with him in the WWE. I just wanted to get him in a spot he belonged in. So yeah, I had big, big plans for him at that point. It didn't take long for Brett's WCW push to begin under the watchful eye of Vince Russo. WCW Mayhem in 1999, the first WCW pay-per-view to ever take place in Canada, would feature the semi-finals and finals of a World Heavyweight Championship tournament, a tournament that the Hitman won after defeating names like Goldberg, Perry Saturn, Billy Kidman, Sting and finally Chris Benoit. I know Brett likes to say he doesn't have any good moments in WCW and he'd rather forget his whole run within the company but Brett fans should check out Mayhem 99. The Sting and Chris Benoit matches here were good, and it was good to see Brett finally reach the top of the WCW mountain. The only problem here though is that it was too little too late. Wrestling fans were all about the WWF and the Attitude Era during this time period. Had WCW went all the way with Brett when the Hitman first showed up on Nitro, then things could have been different, but yeah, here we are. Still, Russo was true to his word. The main event scene would begin centering around the new World Heavyweight Champion, Bret Hart. So far, you might be thinking that Vince Russo was doing a fairly decent job here in picking a guy up who should have been at the top of the ladder anyway, but remember, this is Vince Russo we're talking about here. Ultimately, the plan was to turn Bret into a bad guy once again. Not only would Bret turn heel, but Bret would be the leader of a reborn New World Order faction known as NWO 2000. 
Now, I'm going to be honest, we're talking about Vince Russo booking here towards the end of 1999. Some of this won't seem to make any sense, but you have to throw your better judgement out the window here and just play along. During Brett's final match at Mayhem against Chris Benoit, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall interfered, targeting both Hart and Benoit. Goldberg came to the ring to aid the Hitman and the Crippler, and the match continued on afterwards. The next night on Nitro, Brett came to the ring and he said he'd give Bill Goldberg a title match at Starcade. Goldberg was attacked by the Outsiders during his first round tournament match with Brett, and so the Hitman wanted to give Goldberg a shot at the gold at WCW's biggest pay-per-view of the year. Hall and Nash interrupted Brett and a challenge was made, the Outsiders vs Brett Hart and Goldberg on Monday Nitro. As Brett was about to leave the ring, the chosen one Jeff Jarrett jumped in, smashing a guitar over the Hitman's back. Brett says he'll take care of Jeff Jarrett later on Nitro while Goldberg will take care of the Outsiders. Brett won his match against Jarrett while Goldberg teamed up with old rival Sid Vicious to take on Hall and Nash. The Outsiders won this tag team match. The next week on Nitro, Jeff Jarrett aligned himself with the Outsiders after the Chosen One helped Nash and Hall win a three-way tag team cage match that also featured Bret Hart, Chris Benoit, Sid Vicious and Goldberg. Goldberg was able to beat Jeff Jarrett the following week after getting help from Bret Hart and some other babyfaces of WCW, so you can see the picture that Russo was trying to paint here in the run up to Starcade. Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg were your honourable good guys of WCW who were looking forward to their match at Starcade. Kid, but in the background you had Hall, Nash and Jeff Jarrett causing issues for both men. To further solidify the friendship between Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg, the pair won the WCW Tag Team titles on the December 9th, 99 episode of Thunder thanks to Roddy Piper coming out and replacing a biased referee. Bret said after the match that the whole world will truly find out who is the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be at the Starcade show. Goldberg and Bret's reign as tag champions didn't last long. The Outsiders won the tag titles the following week on Nitro when Bret Hart was mysteriously attacked backstage. We never saw the attack on TV screens. The Hitman did try to run in and help Goldberg during the match, but Bret ended up getting pinned by Kevin Nash. The Goldberg vs Bret Hart Starcade match then has become infamous. Bret knew that Goldberg worked stiff and apparently Bret said to Goldberg backstage that he can do whatever he wants in the ring but just don't injure anyone. Bret was reportedly up for a hard hitting main event but he was extremely wary of Goldberg's ring abilities. Bret and Goldberg shook hands before the match, things were going fine during the opening moments. Goldberg dominated the hitman but Bret began working on Goldberg's leg, softening it up for the inevitable shot. Shooter. Around the 10 minute mark, Brad hits the referee seemingly by accident. After the ref bump, Brad Hart takes the sidekick from Goldberg that would pretty much end his wrestling career. The kick from Goldberg led to a concussion. Brad said that he knew he had to get back to his feet to finish the match, but he had completely forgotten what the finish was. Brad's memory slowly came back, and the match ended with Roddy Piper coming out to officiate the match, ordering for the bell when Goldberg was locked in the sharpshooter. A dazed and confused Bret Hart acted like he didn't know what had just happened, but you can't help but think that some of Bret's confusion at the end of Starcade was very legitimate. Bret would, of course, continue showing up in WCW, but ultimately, Bret's diagnosis of post-concussion syndrome led to Bret Hart eventually retiring from professional wrestling. The severity of Bret Hart's injuries were either not known to WCW staff or people just felt it would get better as time went on. As the very next night on Monday Nitro, Bret Hart was involved in WCW's next major storyline that was originally going to set the scene for the months that followed. To start things off, Kevin Nash came to the ring talking about how the office doesn't care about the boys in the back, talking about the lack of benefits and security that's offered to wrestlers of WCW. Quite a turnaround in comparison to promo most Nash had been delivering, but still, this promo came off pretty well and it was all set up to make Kevin Nash look like a good guy. 
Kevin said that the office will screw any of the boys to make a dollar, and that's exactly what happened to Bill Goldberg. Nash went on to say that he doesn't like Bill, but what happened at Starcade wasn't right, and Kevin says that Bret Hart screwed Goldberg before calling the hitman a piece of shit. Roddy Piper then has a work shoot promo where he says he done what Vince Russo told him to do. The screw job finish was written in the script, but Roddy thinks the ending of Starcade was awful and the fans want to see men fighting in the ring and not a load of phony storylines. Goldberg and Bret Hart show up. Goldberg told Piper that he made the wrong decision at Starcade while Bret Hart said this is all down to the office, echoing Kevin Nash's sentiments regarding the higher ups in WCW making the boys in the locker room look bad. Bret said he didn't want to be the champion if he didn't beat Goldberg fair and square so the hitman went back to Vince Russo and he vacated the championship. It was decided then that Bret Hart vs Goldberg would happen one more time on Nitro with the vacated WCW championship on the line, keep in mind that Bret was working with a severe injury here. The referee gets knocked out, Bret delivers a low blow, and as the hitman applies a figure 4 leg lock on Goldberg, the outsiders hit the ring. We think that Hall and Nash are coming after Bret, but instead... Goldberg gets attacked. The Outsiders hand a baseball bat to the Hitman and it's made clear that the Outsiders were in cahoots with Bret all along. Roddy Piper tries to help Goldberg but he gets taken out and Bret Hart scores the pinfall win. Jeff Jarrett then hits the ring, proceeding to smash a guitar over Piper's head before grabbing a few cans of spray paint. The old familiar NWO theme music plays in the arena and Kevin Nash grabs a microphone saying that the band is back together. With Bret Hart now as the leader, the New World Order were back. This time the group would be known as NWO 2000 and it featured four initial members. US Champion Jeff Jarrett, Tag Team Champion Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and the World Heavyweight Champion Bret Hart. This version of the NWO would have a black and silver logo instead of the classic black and white with the word new underlined in the NWO 2000 logo. The immediate problem here though, as you can probably tell, is Brett's involvement. While I'm sure the best of intentions were there, Brett would be unable to lead the pack and he'd soon be disappearing from TV screens. Had Brett not suffered that injury at Starcade, things would have been very different, but because the original plan could never get played out on TV, the story of NWO 2000 feels unfinished and inconclusive. The group was pretty much abandoned and the addition of new members would kind of hurt the credibility of the faction. Still, the NWO 2000 came to the ring on the December 23rd 99 episode of Thunder for their very first promo together. Brett said that this was all planned for over a month while clips are shown of the NWO's master plan unfolding over the past few weeks. Kevin and Scott go on to say that the fans are stupid and Jeff Jarrett, well Jarrett talks about this NWO being different, saying there will be no watering down with additional members and and that, of course, wouldn't be the case at all. Later in the evening, the NWO's biggest enemy, Bill Goldberg, managed to injure himself when he smashed a limousine window, a window that wasn't gimmicked. And so this new NWO 2000, with its severely injured leader and severely injured biggest enemy, was already off to a terrible start. Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg weren't the only problems here though. Those who watched WCW during this time period would know that Scott Hall was blatantly showing up to TV shows completely wasted. Hall wouldn't show up sometimes on Nitro and eventually his adventures during a European tour in February of 2000 would result in Scott getting released from his WCW contract, according to Hall anyway. Watch this time period back though, while Hall can admittedly be quite funny, he can also be terribly distracting, speaking over other NWO members during promos and whatnot. The December 27th edition of Monday Night Raw would see NWO 2000 go on a backstage rampage before setting their sights on a new target, Sid Vicious. When Brett got word that Sid wanted a WCW title shot at Sold Out 2000, the NWO decided to spray paint Sid's car. Sid got a little revenge later on and it was decided that Kevin Nash and Scott Hall would face Sid and The Wall in the main event, only Scott Hall didn't show up for this edition of Night Raw. Scott Stein 
Minor ended up joining NW2000 at the end of this broadcast, helping the other NW members take out the wall in Sid before Bret Hart ran over Sid's car with a monster truck. So things were pretty standard up until this point and things kinda made sense, but when Bret let the WCW higher-ups know that he now needed time away from the ring, it seemed like all hell broke loose and WCW didn't know what to do. Commissioner Terry Funk booked a match between Kevin Nash and Bret Hart on the January 10th episode of Nitro. If Bret didn't wrestle, he would get stripped of the championship, and Kevin Nash went ahead with the match because he wanted to become champion. The match ended with Arn Anderson and Sid Vicious attacking Nash and Hart, but the damage was seemingly done here. The NW2000 was already beginning to fall apart, and the January 12th episode of WCW Thunder would prove to be a pivotal night for this this new incarnation of the New World Order. Bret Hart didn't arrive to the building with the NWO. The hitman came down to the ring for a promo without his NWO colours. Bret said that he had let everyone down because he tried to take shortcuts, and Bret is now seeing things very differently. Bret apologises for getting associated with the NWO. The hitman announces that he has left the faction and the pink and black attack is back. Nash, Jarrett and Steiner come out. Nash said that Bret could have been a god if he stuck with the New World Order going on to say that the fans loved the NWO and the fans only cared about Bret Hart recently because of his association with the heel faction. Bret says that he will take on each and every member of the NWO. Nash gives Bret a chance to leave the building and go home. Bret refuses and with that, Kevin Nash tells Bret Hart that tonight, the hitman's career will be finished. The NWO are seen beating Bret Hart backstage throughout the night, but Bret comes to the ring at the end of the show to confront his attackers, saying he hasn't ran away from anything in his life and he isn't going to start now. Nash and Jarrett come to the ring with bats, Commissioner Terry Funk and Arn Anderson come to help Bret, Terry is even carrying a branding iron. Terry tells Bret to get out of the ring so Nash and Jarrett can get branded, but Arn Anderson throws a bucket of water over Bret. AA notices that Brett's bruises and cuts are coming off, and with that, Brett and the NWO begin beating up Terry Funk and Arn Anderson. It was all another big Vince Russo swerve. Brett has his NWO colours on underneath the Calgary Hitman shirt, and yeah, the NWO were still in full force. Sold Out 2000 opened up with the news that Bret Hart would not be defending the WCW Championship in the main event. The title had been vacated and Chris Benoit was stepping in for Bret Hart. WCW were honest here, they showed the kick from Goldberg that led to the concussion, and so Bret Hart was now unable to compete in the ring. Brett would still show up to cut promos and interfere in matches, his contract wasn't officially terminated until October of 2000, but Brett didn't wrestle another match for the company. On top of this, Jeff Jarrett also missed Sold Out 2000. He too had a head injury that took him out of his scheduled three Sold Out matches on the evening. The only member of NWO 2000 who had a match at Sold Out was Kevin Nash. Big Sexy defeated Terry Funk to become the new WCW Commissioner. And from here, things just got more ridiculous and hard to follow. The Harris brothers had been acting as Jeff Jarrett's bodyguards and they too became members of the NWO. And because of Kevin Nash's decisions as WCW commissioner, the group once again kinda got split where Nash and Hall became like the Wolfpack spin-off and Jeff Jarrett and the Harris brothers became more like the NWO black and white. Scott Steiner, on the other hand, who knows what he was up to. He was too busy cutting promos about how it's much cooler to watch Steve Austin and the WWE. WF instead of watching Nitro. While all of this was going on, Nash suffered an ankle injury that kept him out of the ring, Scott Hall had his final match at Uncensored before getting fired, and by the time Eric Bischoff showed up to write WCW shows alongside Vince Russo, the NWO had been completely dismantled. Jared Steiner and the Harris brothers joined the New Blood while Kevin Nash joined the Millionaires Club. 
If creative wasn't already questionable enough in WCW, the injury and loss of NWO leader Bret Hart really put the direction of the faction in complete chaos. You've also got Goldberg, the main babyface of the angle, missing in action. You then had Jarrett not appearing at Sold Out, Scott Hall seemingly disappearing and reappearing at random times, and Kevin Nash trying to keep things steady but failing to do so with the constant changes that were going on. Once the Harris brothers came in, with all due respect, it seemed like WCW had tapped out on the angle. WCW got around 3 months out of NWO 2000, only around 3 weeks of it were worth watching while the rest was a fine demonstration of the pure lack of direction WCW had at the time. It does make you wonder what the ultimate plan was for Bret Hart in the year 2000 though. Of course a Goldberg vs Hart rematch was inevitable but you also had the upcoming return of Hulk Hogan along with the return of a man who had previously failed to elevate Bret to the next level in WCW, one Eric Bischoff. With this in mind it's probably safe to assume that the future looked pretty dull for Bret Hart anyway, and while the NWO 2000 was a nice idea to get Bret pushed as a big heel in WCW, the whole faction could never live up to its old roots back in 1996. When the WWF locker room was asked how they would feel about Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall making a return in 2002, the question was met with mixed responses. Many guys who formed the WWF roster at the time had worked alongside the NWO and many had first hand experience of the faction's political moves within WCW. You also had your WWF veterans who stuck with the company throughout the Monday Night Wars and these veterans felt that guys like Hogan, Nash and Hall had legitimately tried to put the World Wrestling Federation out of business. Vince McMahon, however, knew there was still value in the NWO name and more so, there was a ton of value in the Hulk Hogan name. It can't be denied that Hulk Hogan was instrumental in making the WWF what it is today, the golden boy of a previous generation who helped make WrestleMania the pinnacle of sports entertainment, the epitome of 80s WWF who the company was built around for so long with a great deal of success. For Vince McMahon, bringing Hulk Hogan back, on a tight leash of course, was a no brainer. While many guys didn't want to see Hogan and the Outsiders back in the locker room, Vince McMahon approached one of his biggest stars, The Rock, to see how the Great One felt about Hulk Hogan coming back to the World Wrestling Federation. Not only this, Vince McMahon asked The Rock how he felt about having a match against Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania. Rock loved the idea, Vince pitched the Hogan match to Rocky as a means to establish the greatest of all time, a battle of the generations to find out who really was the one true icon of professional wrestling. With the Rock sold on the match and the business upside being too great to pass up, the rest of the locker room would really have no other option but to get on board with Hulk Hogan and the Outsiders coming to the WWF under the NWO banner. Vince McMahon got in contact with Hulk Hogan and to establish that tight leash, Vince McMahon told Hogan that if he's coming back, he better bring it. Hogan had gotten by with doing the bare minimum over the past few years of his professional career, and Vince McMahon's WWF in 2002, there was an expectation to deliver in the ring. The Rock was not Vince McMahon's first choice for Hulk Hogan's WrestleMania 18 opponent. Stone Cold Steve Austin was approached by McMahon before Rocky and Steve Austin refused to work with Hogan at WrestleMania. Steve Austin said in the WWF Raw magazine, I really didn't have a problem with the NWO, me and Kevin Nash used to be riding partners, he's a good friend of mine. The only one I heard that was a pile of trash was Hulk Hogan because he's a manipulator and he does backstage politics, he's proven that to this day. Steve Austin also said in a different interview, it could have happened, I just never really wanted to wrestle the guy I guess, that's the most honest answer. That's a matchup that looks good on paper, but I don't think it would have looked that good once it got in the ring. I was in a different place at that time, I tried to make that happen in WCW and obviously I wasn't high enough on the totem pole for him to consider it. When it came time to when it could have happened while I was in the WWE, the timing wasn't right. 
This video is going to focus on Rock vs Hogan, but I felt it necessary to get the Steve Austin stuff out of the way too, as Austin would end up working against Scott Hall during this time period. A series of events would lead to Stone Cold no-showing WWF shows and eventually Austin would walk out of the company. Still, that's for a different video, let's move back to The Rock. Even though the People's Champion was the second choice here, Rock didn't really see anything wrong with doing business with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania. Rocky understood that Hogan would be doing the job too. I think that much would have been made clear when the whole NWO debut was pitched to both Austin and Rock. Hulk Hogan has even gone on record to say he didn't have any issues losing to The Rock or Austin at WrestleMania, so that key fact, that key victory over a wrestling legend like Hogan, sure would have been enough to sweeten the deal. But with that being said, this is wrestling. Outcomes can change before and even during a match. Rocky said, he knew not to count his chickens before they hatched when it came to match outcomes. Still, Vince McMahon's WrestleMania 18 pitch had gone over well with The Rock, and plans were made to bring the NWO into the World Wrestling Federation at the No Way Out 2002 pay-per-view. In storyline, Vince McMahon had been having a power struggle with Ric Flair over the complete ownership of the World Wrestling Federation. When things got tough, Vince decided that the best course of action was to kill the company that he created. If Vince couldn't have the World Wrestling Federation, then no one could have the World Wrestling Federation. On the January 24th, 2002 episode of SmackDown, Vince announced that in order to destroy his own creation, he would inject the WWF with a lethal dose of poison. In that point, Poison was the new world order. Videos aired over the next few weeks that hyped the WWF debut of the NWO at the WWF No Way Out pay per view, while longtime old school fans were coming to terms with Hulk Hogan finally making a return to the World Wrestling Federation. This was huge. Hogan left the WWF on bad terms, and in WCW, Hogan and company were ferocious in their quest to make WCW the most watched wrestling program in the United States by any means necessary. And let's not forget about Scott Hall and Kevin Nash too. Diesel and Razor Ramon were, at one time, big WWF attractions and it was their jump to WCW that sent the Monday Night Wars into overdrive. And many fans were curious to see how Nash and Hall would get used during this return. At the WWF No Way Out 2002 pay-per-view, the show kicked off with that familiar NWO theme music. Out walked Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Hollywood Hulk Hogan. It was truly something that many wrestling fans thought they would never see. Hall and Nash said that they aren't the bad guys here, they are fans of the WWF and they don't want any trouble, trying to come across as good guys here. Scott Hall got a great ovation from the audience, but when it was time for Hulk Hogan to speak, the crowd broke out in a huge Hogan chant. Hulk said the NWO is here to make the WWF better. All they want is a chance to prove themselves to both the fans and the boys in the locker room. Hulk said God bless Vince McMahon, God bless the fans and God bless America. It looked like the NWO had turned a new leaf, even bumping into The Rock and Steve Austin backstage and trying their best to remain friendly. But when the heel faction cost Stone Cold the Undisputed Championship at the end of the pay-per-view, it was clear that the New World Order were still bad guys after all. Hollywood Hogan came to the ring the next night on Raw as the fans again chanted Hulk's name. Hogan talked about how good it was to be back in a WWF ring, saying that the World Wrestling Federation made Hulk Hogan a legend and the fans of the WWF had seen Hulk Hogan do it all during the mid 80s and early 90s. To bring the mood down, Hogan said, Something happened, you people turned on me. Why did you start taking Hulk Hogan for granted? I never wanted to leave the WWF, I wanted to stay in the WWF and I wanted to end my career in the WWF. Suddenly you didn't have any more respect for Hulk Hogan, suddenly you drove me out of the WWF. I'm the reason all you people are here, I'm the one that put the WWF on the map, I'm the one who made wrestling as big as it is today. There's nobody in this business that's a bigger icon than I am. I'm the biggest star, past or present, in the wrestling world today, and there'll never be a bigger star in the wrestling business than Hollywood Hulk Hogan. 
At that very moment, the rock came down to the squared circle. Hogan and Rock took their sunglasses off to get a good look at each other as the two men circled around the ring. Rock said that nobody could have foreseen Hulk Hogan and the Rock standing in the same ring at the very same time, before telling Hulk Hogan that it wasn't the fans who drove him out of the WWF. Rocky says the fans loved and believed in Hulkamania, and Rock even admits that he once believed in Hulkamania. Rocky said, you are, without a shadow of a doubt, a legend. You are, without a shadow of a doubt, an icon. Quite possibly, the best ever. And seeing as you're back in the WWF because of Vince McMahon, The Rock has one thing to say. You talk about headlining WrestleMania after WrestleMania after WrestleMania. Well, Hulk Hogan, how do you feel about headlining one more WrestleMania with The Rock? With the challenge now laid down, The Rock and Hulk Hogan stood face to face, as Jim Ross says, it feels like time has stood still. Rock and Hogan looked out at the fans, turning their heads left to right and right to left as the audience chanted for both men. It couldn't have worked out any better here. This stare down would get reused in the WrestleMania match to dramatic effect and it's one of the moments that many fans remember vividly from WrestleMania 18. Hogan says that The Rock is nothing more than the flavour of the month, the Hulkster has seen guys come and go and the people's champion is just like all the rest. Rocky interrupts Hulk by demanding an answer, telling Hogan that the proposed WrestleMania 18 fantasy match would transcend the wrestling industry as both men competed to see who the best really is. The Rock asked the people if they wanted to see the immortal Hulk Hogan versus the Great One at WrestleMania and finally Hogan agreed to the match. The two shook hands but the people's champion pulled Hulk back in for the rock bottom and as Rocky was making his way back up the ramp, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash blindsided the great one, leading to the rock taking a beating from the NWO that saw Rocky take a bunch of finishers along with the classic NWO spray paint job. Eventually Rocky was put in an ambulance but the NWO were not content with the punishment they just dished out. Hulk Hogan decided to ram the ambulance with a semi-truck. The Rock was written off TV for a short period of time while the NWO moved their focus onto Stone Cold Steve Austin. While Austin didn't want to work with Hogan, he did agree to work with Scott Hall, so Hall vs Austin was penciled in for WrestleMania 18. Hulk Hogan kept his rivalry with The Rock going by cutting promos on The Great One while Rocky wasn't there to answer back, even cutting a promo on a cardboard cutout that was still strangely entertaining. The driving force behind the match was all about who was the very best, who was the biggest superstar in the history of wrestling. And yes, many fans would say that neither Hogan nor Rock belonged in a match with this high of a billing, and many fans would say that it was pretentious for the WWF to slap such a tagline on this WrestleMania match. Personally, I do feel that Austin vs Hogan would have meant a lot more, but beggars can't be choosers. This is what we got, and at the end of the day, The Rock and Hulk Hogan made the absolute best of it. To ensure the match would go without a hitch, the Hulkster done something he never used to do. He sat with The Rock, Michael Hayes, Pat Patterson and Vince McMahon to lay out the entire match. And not only this, Hulk Hogan paid a visit to The Rock and his late father Rocky Johnson in Miami to go over some some of the finer details of the bout. Hogan said that Rocky Johnson told his son to listen to what Hogan had to say, but when it came time to take some bumps in training, Hogan refused, saying he was too worried about getting injured in the run up to WrestleMania. Funnily enough, on the 1st of March, around two and a half weeks before Mania, Hogan managed to injure himself. The Hulkster had his very first match of this WWF return when he faced Rikishi in Tampa, Florida, a house show match that saw Hogan and get the victory. Hogan said that he was distracted by his family at ringside during the match and he didn't protect himself properly, resulting in the Hulkster getting a cracked rib, at least according to Hogan anyway. It's up to you whether you believe Hulk Hogan worked at WrestleMania with this injury or not, but Hogan did begin holding his stomach and chest as the match progressed. Either way, it is worth noting. Rocky returned on the March 7th, 2002 episode of SmackDown, just 10 days before WrestleMania 18, and the Great One cut a fantastic promo here that was sprinkled with a little truth. Rock said that when Vince McMahon announced the NWO were coming to the WWF, a lot of people in the back were concerned about this poison being injected into the company, but Rocky got excited at the idea of facing Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania. 
Rocky then said he became so obsessed with what Hulk Hogan used to be that he temporarily forgotten what Hulk Hogan had now become, jaded, bitter and self-centered. Rock challenges Hogan to a confrontation on SmackDown, but the Great One gets the whole New World Order instead. Hulk Hogan says he's going to wait until WrestleMania before defeating The Rock, but Scott Hall is looking for a fight. The bad guy and the Great One main event in SmackDown, the match ended when Nash and Hogan interfered, leading to Stone Cold Steve Austin coming down to make the save. Vince McMahon came out and a 3 on 2 handicap match was announced for the following week's episode of Raw. The NWO would take on Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock one week before WrestleMania. The March 11th, 2002 episode of Monday Night Raw is quite significant. This is the one and only time Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan, the true original founding fathers of the NWO, would compete as a team inside a WWF ring. On the other side, you had The Rock and Steve Austin teaming up, a star-studded team in its own right that also had a little bit of history behind it. And on top of all that, this is the only time in history that Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan would be involved in a match together in a WWF setting. You can't help but feel though that this match would have been a much bigger deal around three years prior and the action in the ring surely would have been better also, but as an attraction match this was still pretty big. I wish I could say it was a good bout, but it wasn't. The NWO kept stopping the babyface's momentum, Kevin Nash in particular didn't bring much to the table and in the end Hogan pinned Rock to score the victory. After what we just learned regarding Steve Austin's feelings towards the Hulkster, Stone Cold getting pinned was never an option here. I still give this match a pass though just for how historic it is and the obvious goal here was to make the NWO look like viable threats to the biggest baby faces the WWF had to offer but still the execution wasn't great here. Again I do wish I could say this match was good. WrestleMania 18 was held in the Toronto Skydome, a venue that had quite a lot of significance for Hulk Hogan and indeed the whole WWF. WrestleMania 6 was held in the same venue, the very first WrestleMania event to take place outside of the United States, with WrestleMania 18 only being the second. The Toronto wrestling audience was superb at Mania 6, and 12 years later, they were still loud and they were also filled to the brim with wrestling nostalgia. On April 1st, 1990, the Sky Dome hosted the ultimate challenge when Hulk Hogan put his WWF title on the line against Intercontinental Champion The Ultimate Warrior, creating a bona fide WrestleMania classic that stood the test of time. Hogan lost the match and many saw this defeat as the Hulkster maybe passing the torch on to a new, more contemporary wrestling superstar. By 1991, just a year later, Hulk Hogan was back in the WWF title picture while the Ultimate Warrior was moved into a semi-main spot. So this maybe wasn't the passing of the torch that many predicted. In the very same venue in 2002, after Hollywood Hogan had a very interesting time in World Championship Wrestling, the Hulkster was back and here he had the opportunity to pass his complete legacy onto someone else. While The Rock was already firmly established as a WWF main eventer and WrestleMania headliner, a win over Hulk Hogan would still go an incredibly long way in cementing Rock's name in the history books and to his credit the Rock noticed that there was really nothing to lose when battling Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania, unlike Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin was maybe letting pride get the better of him, Stone Cold has admitted that he wasn't in the right place mentally during this time of his life, and today he does regret not having the match with Hogan at WrestleMania, but it is what it is. Hogan and the WWF had done everything they could to make Hulk look like a bad guy going into WrestleMania on March 17th, 2002, but audiences were still chanting for Hogan out of nostalgia and respect. The Rock and Hulk Hogan aren't dumb either, Rocky clearly says in promos running up to the match that the Sky Dome would be chanting for Hogan just as much as they chanted for Rocky, but nobody could have predicted how much the Toronto audience got behind the Hulkster at WrestleMania 18. 
Rocky had a pre-match interview with the coach during the first half of the show and the audience could be heard booing the great one in the background as Rock said that he wants Hulkamania to run wild tonight and he wants Hulkamania in all of its glory. Scott Hall lost his match to Steve Austin and the Outsiders planned on taking out their frustrations on the people's champ but Hulk Hogan requested that Hall and Nash stayed in the back. This was very smart here. Vincent Company had taken note of Hogan's reactions on Raw and the rather hostile reaction The Rock got during his promo earlier at WrestleMania. The WWF knew Hogan was going to get a good reaction when he walked into the Sky Dome, but the WWF weren't banking on the audience going absolutely insane and Hulkamania getting reborn at WrestleMania 18. The time for talking though was now over. After airing an excellent build up video, the screen goes black and white. Hulk Hogan walks out to an incredible ovation as Jim Ross is forced to tell fans at home that there's a lot of Hogan fans here in Toronto. The crowd roars when Hulk Hogan rips off his shirt, further proving that the fans in the Toronto Sky Dome were all about the nostalgia. Rock does get a decent ovation too in all fairness when his music hits and the great one makes his way down to the ring. What happens next though is a true moment that many fans think of instantly when they hear mention of Wrestlemania 18. The stare down. Remember how Rock and Hogan looked at each side of the arena the night after No Way Out? slowly turning their heads in opposite directions to get the audience hyped up? Well, this happens again at WrestleMania, only this time the crowd can be seen literally jumping up and down and making as much noise as humanly possible. Jim Ross says that this is a WrestleMania moment and he's 100% on the money with that statement. The fans in attendance were so good here at WrestleMania 18. While Hogan vs Rock was always going to be a good match, the Toronto fans made it one for the ages and it really goes to show how a crowd can make a match special. Hulk Hogan said he felt like he was back at WrestleMania 3. The atmosphere and the energy in the Sky Dome took him back to the Pontiac Silverdome when he stood face to face with Andre the Giant. Without either man even lifting a finger, Hogan and Rock had WrestleMania 18 in a state of extreme excitement. The two men lock up and when Hogan overpowers Rock by throwing him into the corner, the audience erupts. Hulk Hogan makes sure to flex his 24 inch pythons for maximum effect and even Hulk himself looks surprised at the response he's getting from the fans. Hogan then applies a headlock and when Rocky shoots the Hulkster off the ropes, Hogan comes back with a big shoulder block that again sends Rocky flying to the mat. And it's at this point where Rock realises that he and Hulk need to change up their match. Hogan breaks out some more classic Hulkster poses and any shadow of a doubt is thrown out of the window. This audience is firmly behind Hulk Hogan and they want to boo The Rock. Being quick on his feet and wanting to deliver what the audience want, The Rock decided to adapt and let Hogan do his thing. Hogan said that he overpowered The Rock in the early moments of the match in order to look like a quote real monster. Hulk reasoned that he'd done this because he wanted The Rock to look as good as possible whenever Hogan's shoulders were finally put on the mat. But some fans would say that Hogan was looking after Hogan by posing afterwards and rallying the audience in his favour. To be honest, even if he was only looking after himself, I don't care. As a wrestling fan watching a wrestling match on TV, it added so much more to the bout that I think it was totally worth it. The audience turned out to be the most important aspect of this match and if the opportunity is there to get the crowd even more hyped up then I say go for it. Out of respect, The Rock allowed Hogan to call the match, meaning Hogan would lead the way and call the spots and moves that were coming up next in their planned match. Rock said in a recent interview that if Hogan told him to take the bump, Rocky took the bump. And say what you want about Hulk Hogan, he may not have had the best ring skills but he knew match psychology like no one else. The man became a megastar without hardly breaking a sweat. When Rocky and Hogan noticed that the Toronto audience were getting behind the Hulkster, their planned match was thrown out and Rock began subtly working as a heel. 
It would be silly to think that Vince McMahon wasn't also directing the match backstage. Nobody is going to go into business for themselves at WrestleMania, no matter how much of a great story it makes. But what has to be applauded here is Hogan and Rock's ability to roll with it and give the fans what they wanted. Hogan didn't deviate too much. Hulk still choked Rocky, he scratched his back, he beat him with his belt, but everything Hogan would do got a huge ovation. This did a lot to protect the Hulkster. This wasn't a great in-ring performance from Hogan when you talk about actual wrestling moves and bumping around the ring, but it really didn't matter. Anything Hogan done here got cheered while the fans stayed against the great one. It does make for a really captivating and different match. The showdown picks up a little after a referee bump. With Mike Chioda down and out, The Rock hits a spine buster followed by a sharpshooter. The audience boos loudly as Hulk Hogan begins tapping out, yet there's no referee to make the call. When Rock tries to bring the referee around, Hogan hits a low blow followed by a rock bottom. The referee wakes up, but Hogan only manages a two count. Hogan then takes off his belt and begins whipping The Rock, but Rocky gets the upper hand with a DDT. Rock gives the audience an evil look as he picks up the belt, it's Hogan's turn to take a weapon. A rock bottom is delivered and just when you think The Rock has the match won, Hogan kicks out and begins hulking up, one of the most effective hulk ups in Hogan's career. Hogan delivers the big boot and the leg drop and Rock kicks out. There isn't a person sitting down in the Sky Dome at this point. Hogan hits another big boot but he misses the second leg drop. Rock hits two more rock bottoms and the people's elbow is delivered to end the match. Incredibly, the crowd roars at the end of the match. Fans in attendance make noise for both The Rock and Hulk Hogan knowing they had just been part of a Wrestlemania classic. Hogan and Rock shake hands afterwards. The outsiders come to the ring upset at this handshake which led to Rock and Hogan taking out Nash and Hall. And to end their time at WrestleMania 18, The Rock gave Hogan the stage to perform his signature poses. This was great too, again Rock and Hogan giving fans what they wanted to see. The next night on Raw, Hulk Hogan came out to another fantastic ovation, saying that The Rock was the better man, but one day, Hulk Hogan will square off with the People's Champion one more time. The Rock comes to the ring, Hogan removes his NWO colours, and in the main event of Raw, Hogan and Rocky defeat Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, thus beginning a babyface run for Hulk Hogan in 2002. There have been a ton of wrestling bouts throughout history that have carried a ton of raw fan emotion that have really helped the matches stand out. Matches off the top of my head that fall into this category include Ron Simmons vs Big Van Vader, Eddie Guerrero vs Brock Lesnar, Randy Savage vs The Ultimate Warrior and Shawn Michaels vs Ric Flair. It's unfair to compare these matches against each other based on crowd responses because each bout was different. Fans got involved for various reasons but these matches all stand out because fans were so emotionally invested that you could even tell the participants in the ring were feeling it. Hogan and Rock went one step further by altering their match to suit the fans and for that reason, for me, it stands out as one of the best Wrestlemania matches of all time. Hulk Hogan isn't the most popular guy in the world these days, but to say he didn't know how to work an audience would be just lying to ourselves really. If you've never seen Hogan vs Rock for whatever reason, get on it right away, and if you haven't seen it in a long time, this is a perfect excuse to go and check it out once again. Thanks very much for watching this video. On the June 3rd episode of Raw in 2002, Shawn Michaels made a return to the WWE. Kevin Nash had promised an announcement that would shake the very core of world wrestling entertainment, and he didn't disappoint. Nash announced that HBK was the newest member of the New World Order, and when he came to the ring, Shawn looked like he was in great shape. There was no mic time here, we would have to wait until the following week to see what Shawn had to say. The next week on Raw, Sean ducked out of backstage interviews as Kevin Nash said that HBK will talk to the people later in the ring. Sean went to the ring later in the evening and he said, Back in my day in the WWE, we had it all. We had garbage men, we had clowns, you name it and we had it all. 
There was one thing, however, that was very real, and that was me. Night in and night out, I gave you everything I had. Then came WrestleMania 14, and Vince and the boys decided maybe we should go in another direction. Maybe we should go with attitude. Man, I was attitude in this place before it was a catchphrase. Vince McMahon always says it's you, the fans, who determine where we go as an organisation, so it was really you fans that dumped me and ran to Stone Cold Steve Austin. I can assure you I am not here to wrestle, I done that for you once and rest assured I'll never make that mistake again. Sean then says that Kevin Nash was the only person in wrestling who remained his friend through all the hard times. The NWO then made their way to the ring and Sean continued his promo, hyping each member of the New World Order before getting to Booker T. Sean didn't hype up Booker T, but instead he super kicked him and ejected him from the New World Order. So it seemed like HBK was a sort of spokesman for the NWO, he wasn't going to wrestle and he made it clear also that Kevin Nash was still the leader. As the weeks went on, it seemed like the NWO was quite dysfunctional as the group was more about dishing out tough love to each other rather than taking out the company's top stars. A storyline developed where the NWO were trying to recruit Triple H as HBK would remind Hunter to make the right decision upon his WWE return. It was a decent story, no one was sure what Hunter's decision would be and seeing Triple H in the NWO colours sure would have been interesting. The storyline, however, never got finished. On the July 8th 2002 episode of Raw, Kevin Nash worked a tag match in the main event. This was Nash's first match in around 4 months, having been on the shelf due to injury. In this Raw main event, Kevin Nash again got injured, tearing his quad and becoming the subject of one of the most played out wrestling jokes in history. The NWO was disbanded afterwards, with Vince McMahon believing there was no point in continuing the story or the faction. Triple H was due to make his decision regarding the NWO at Vengeance 2002, but now Triple H showed up at Vengeance to choose if he would go to Raw or go to SmackDown. <laughs> 